Taken on the Middle East. Yeah. So, uh, well, my honourable friend can have absolutely that uh, assurance. And if I may, uh, whilst it is shocking to see what is happening in the region, it is too often forgotten. I'm afraid, including in this house today, from some members opposite, that this all began with the taking of those hostages, and we will never forget. Martin Day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pension justice is on everybody's lips just now. So, can the minister tell me what this government has done to support the 30,000 veterans who left the service before 1975 and have lost out on preserved pensions? Yeah, yeah. Minister, I'm very grateful to the honourable gentleman. As he knows very well, consecutive governments have made it plain that we don't make changes retrospectively to pensions. As for pensions overall for the armed forces, Mr. Speaker, you'll know, uh, as I do as a beneficiary, they are equitable, fair, and generous. Then Caroline Dining. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The 2016 Better Defence Estates plans are earmarked Fort Blockhouse in Gosport for disposal. Here we are eight years later with numerous delays, and that site is still rotting at taxpayers' expense, doing nothing for the local economy, nothing for the local community, and nothing for the MOD. Can the Minister please update me when we will finally see some progress on that site? I'm grateful to my right honourable friend, and I enjoyed my visit to her constituency where we looked at a range of infrastructure and accommodation. I appreciate that she wants to see progress here. I would just stress um, whilst we engage as closely as possible with Gosport Council on it and want to make progress, it is a very complex site. Um, there are significant defence assets still in place with DIO but also with the Royal Navy, but I'm committed to looking at what more we can do and to engaging further with her. Jessica Morden. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. There are tens of thousands of pregnant women in Gaza suffering malnutrition and at serious risk of delivering their babies unsafely and without health care. Can the Minister outline what particular steps are taken along with the Foreign Secretary to support delivery of food and medical to supplies to these particularly vulnerable women? Well, Mr. Speaker, we are working to try to bring the supplies to uh, all of the uh, citizens of uh, Gaza. Uh, I didn't run through the list of provisions, but it does include provisions for those in a medical need, and particularly uh, women who may be pregnant. As I mentioned earlier, we are working on plans with the Americans in particular, but also the Jordanians, to provide vastly uh, greater amounts of aid into Gaza. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the terrible uh, terrorist attacks in Moscow reminds us that jihadi extremism has not disappeared given its ideology, its reach and its strength. Would the Secretary of State agree with me that uh, ISIS-K is very much a threat to the West as it is to Russia? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, the right honourable gentleman is absolutely right. Uh, there's a perception that Daesh has gone away. Daesh core is cooped up in prisons uh, in northern Syria. But uh, Daesh affiliates are growing um, alarmingly quickly in other parts of the world, and the attack in Moscow is a reminder to us all that we must continue to focus both on the counter-terror threat as well as the state threats. Final question, Dan Jarvis. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I wish the Minister for the Armed Forces all the very best for his next posting? He will recall that on the 1st of February he made a commitment to reassess the Arab eligibility specifically for former members of the Triples, and he said that it's a process that would take 12 weeks. Can I ask him to give an update on the progress that's been made with that work to date? Uh, Mr Speaker, it's disappointing to finish on a down note, but uh, as the Honourable Gentleman knows from a written answer that I gave him earlier in the week, it has taken longer than I wanted to establish an independent group of new casework assessors, uh, and thus that 12-week period has not yet begun. I am told by officials when I reluctantly signed off the answer to him earlier in the week that that process is nigh on complete and thus the 12 weeks should start imminently and he won't be surprised to know that preempting the honourable gentleman's question I have encouraged them that eight weeks would sound awful, an awful lot better than 12 given the delay in getting started. Uh, complete questions. Point of order. Is it relating to defence questions? Dave Dugan. Mr Speaker, uh, at defence questions on the 8th of January, I asked the Defence Procurement Minister a very straightforward question about HMS Argyle, the type of question you would expect the Defence Procurement Minister to have an answer at his fingertips, but instead he said as quickly and as curtly as he could that he would write to me with an answer. It's almost three months later, Mr Speaker, and I regret to inform you and the House I have received no such 
information from the Defence Procurement Minister, nor have I even received an acknowledgement that he intends to do so. Can I ask your advice that when honourable and right honourable members get a slippery minister on the hook and they choose to wriggle off it by promising to write to members and they then do not, what recourse, what recourse do members of Parliament have? Well, first of all, I think we ought to choose the language when you want to, when you want to respond. And I would say, and I had a lot of sympathy, actually it does relate to these questions, but I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt because I think it's an important matter. As a senior member of the SNP and being their spokesperson, I do expect you to get timely replies. I don't expect replies to take so long. I'm sure that the bench has heard, and I would expect a response to be sent rather quickly following your intervention. Right, we're now coming to the statement. I now call the Deputy Prime Minister, Right Honourable Oliver Downing. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With your permission, I will make a statement about malicious cyber activity targeting the United Kingdom by actors that we assess are affiliated to the Chinese state. I want to update the House on our assessment of this activity, and I want to reassure the House on the steps that the Government has taken to shore up our resilience and to hold those actors to account. I know that honourable and right honourable members on both sides of this chamber will recognise the seriousness of this issue, particularly in a year when so many democratic elections will be taking place around the world. Members will be want to be reassured that the Government is taking steps to address the associated threat. I can confirm today that Chinese state-affiliated actors were responsible for two malicious cyber campaigns targeting both our democratic institutions and parliamentarians. First, the compromise of the United Kingdom Electoral Commission between 2021 and 2022, which was announced last summer. And second, attempted reconnaissance activity against UK parliamentary accounts in a separate campaign in 2021. Later today, a number of our international partners, including the United States, will be issuing similar statements to expose this activity and to hold China to account for the ongoing patterns of hostile activity targeting our collective democracies. Mr Speaker, you and parliamentary security have already been briefed on this activity. We want now to be as open as possible with the House and with the British public, because part of our defence is calling out this behaviour. This is the latest in a clear pattern of hostile activity originating in China, including the targeting of democratic institutions and parliamentarians in the United Kingdom and beyond. We have seen this in China's continued disregard for universal human rights and international commitments in Xinjiang, China's erasure of dissenting voices and stifling of the opposition under the new national security law in Hong Kong, and the disturbing reports of Chinese intimidation and aggressive behaviour in the South China Sea. It is why this government has investigated and called out so-called Chinese overseas police service stations and instructed the Chinese embassy to close them. However, their cumulative attempts to interfere with the United Kingdom's democracy have not succeeded. Last summer, the Electoral Commission stated that it had been a victim of a complex cyber attack between 2021 and 2022. This was the work of Chinese state-affiliated actors. These actors gained access to the Electoral Commission's email and file sharing systems, which contained copies of the Electoral Register. As the Electoral Commission stated in 2023, when this attack was first made public, the compromise has not affected the security of elections. It will not impact 
how people register, vote or otherwise participate in democratic processes. I want to reassure people that the compromise of this information, whilst it is obviously concerning, typically does not create a risk to those affected. And I want to further reassure the House that the Commission has worked with security specialists to investigate the incident and remove the threat from their systems. The Commission has since taken further steps to increase the resilience of their systems. In addition, the National Cyber Security Centre assesses it is almost certain that the Chinese affiliated, state affiliated cyber actor known as APT31 attempted to conduct reconnaissance activity against UK parliamentary accounts during a separate campaign in 2021. Honourable mem members may recall that APT31 was one of several cyber actors attributed to the Chinese Ministry of State Security by the United Kingdom and its allies in July 2021. This email campaign by APT31 was blocked by Parliament's cyber security measures. In this case, it was entirely unsuccessful. However, any targeting of members of this House by foreign state actors is completely unacceptable. Taken together, the United Kingdom judges that these actions demonstrate a clear and persistent pattern of behaviour that signal, signals hostile intent from China. That is why the United Kingdom has today sanctioned two individuals and one entity associated with the Chinese state-affiliated APT31 group for involvement in malicious cyber activity targeting officials, government entities and parliamentarians around the world. We are today acting to warn of the breadth of targeting emanating from Chinese state-affiliated actors like APT31, to sanction those actors who attempt to threaten our democratic institutions and to deter both China and all those who seek to do the same. Yeah. Mr Speaker, last week at the Summit for Democracy in Seoul, I said that we would call out malicious attempts to undermine our democracy yeah, yeah. wherever we find them. This is an important tool in our armoury and today we are doing just that. The UK does not accept that China's relationship with the United Kingdom is set on a predetermined course, but this depends on the choices that China makes. That is why the Foreign Office will be summoning the Chinese ambassador to account for China's conduct in these incidents. The UK's policy towards China is anchored in our core national interests. Where it is consistent with these interests, we will engage with the Chinese government, but we will not hesitate to take swift and robust actions wherever the Chinese government threatens the United Kingdom's interests. We have done so today and previously. This government will continue to hold China and other state actors accountable for their actions. We will also take serious action to prevent this behaviour from affecting our security. The steps we have taken in recent years have made the UK a harder operating environment for foreign state actors seeking to target our values and our institutions. Through the National Security Act, we now have for the first time a specific offence of foreign interference. This new offence will allow law enforcement to disrupt state-linked efforts to undermine our institutions' rights or political system. Our National Security and Investment Act has overhauled our scrutiny of investment into the United Kingdom by giving the government powers to block, unwind or put conditions on investments that could create national security risks. We have significantly reduced China's involvement in the UK's civil nuclear sector, taking ownership of the CGN's stake in Sizewell Sea nuclear power project and ensuring Chinese state-owned nuclear energy corporations will have no further role in the project. We have put in place measures to prevent hostile infiltration of our universities, 
including protecting campuses from interference through the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Act. The Procurement Act includes national security development provisions that allow us to act where we see <laughs> malicious influence in our public procurement. I have taken steps to reduce the government's exposure to Chinese operators, banning Hikvision and TikTok from government buildings and devices. And through the National Cyber Security Strategy, we're investing £2.6 billion to increase the cyber resilience of our critical national infrastructure by 2025, making the most important parts of our digital environment a harder target for state and non-state actors. The Government is continuing to build the tools, expertise and knowledge to respond to the systemic challenge that China poses to the United Kingdom's security and its values. The integrated review refresh in 2023 took steps towards this, doubling funding for a government-wide programme, including investment in Mandarin language training and deepening diplomatic expertise. But we must also be clear that this is not a problem for the government to solve alone. That is why we created the National Protective Security Authority within MI5 to help businesses and institutions play their part in protecting our security and prosperity. The NPSA will help organisations in the UK's most sensitive fields, including critical national infrastructure operators and world-leading science and tech sectors, to protect themselves against state threats. It's also why I set up the Economic Security Public-Private Forum to ensure that businesses, business leaders in crucial sectors understand the threat to the UK and what they can do to defeat it. And in Parliament, the National Cyber Security Centre has launched an opt-in service for members of both houses. This allows the NCSC to alert high-risk individuals if they identify evidence of malicious activity on their personal devices or account and swiftly advise them on steps to take to protect their information. Today, the NCSC has published new guidance for political organisations, including political parties and think tanks, which will help these organisations take effective action to protect their systems and their data. The NCSC is also working with all political parties to increase the uptake of their active cyber defence services in the lead up to a general election. A key component of increasing our resilience is supporting the NCSC and parliamentary authorities by taking up this cyber security offer. And so I urge all members of this House to do so, and I will be writing to colleagues later today, setting out again the steps that they can take to do so. At the Summit for Democracy, I was struck by the powerful strength of our collective voices when we worked together to defend our democratic freedoms. The Summit provided the United Kingdom Government with a platform to build international agreement on a new global government compact on countering deceptive use of AI by foreign states in elections. It's important and welcome that our partners across the Five Eyes, as well as those in Europe and the Indo-Pacific, are also standing in solidarity with our efforts to call out malicious cyber activity. I would also like to pay tribute to the dedicated public servants whose painstaking work has continued to expose the reality of the threat we face. Mr Speaker, our political processes and institutions have not been harmed by these attacks. The Government will continue to call out and condemn this kind of activity in the strongest terms. We will continue to work with our allies to ensure that Chinese state-affiliated actors suffer the consequences of their behaviour, and we will take preventative action to ensure these attempts do not succeed. The cyber threat posed by China-affiliated actors is real and it is serious, but it is more than equalled by our determination and resolve to resist it. That is how we defend ourselves and our precious democracy, and I commend this statement to the House. Can I just say it was an important statement. That's why it has run on quite a lot longer than the normal 10 minutes. So in which case, I'm sure everybody will agree that if the two front benches need a little extra time, of course, we'll be flexible exactly in the same way. 
I now come to the Shadow Secretary, Pat Matfadden. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the Deputy Prime Minister for his statement and for advance sight of it. Uh, it is, of course, a statement about which there has been significant briefing yep. in the press over the past couple of days. Now, on questions of national security, we will support the Government in efforts to counter attempts by China or any other state to interfere with or undermine the democratic process, or attempts to stop elected representatives going about their business, voicing their opinions or casting their votes without fear or favour. And with that in mind, can I pay tribute to the efforts made every day by the intelligence and security services to protect the public, to protect our democracy and our way of life. The economic relationship between the United Kingdom and China can never mean compromising on national security or our democratic integrity. Now, the uh, Deputy Prime Minister's uh, statement touches on a number of issues, and I'd like to ask him some questions about these. Could he say more about the government's assessment of Chinese motives? Uh, does he, for example, believe that Beijing does want to disrupt our democratic process or instead to gather data about our citizens for some other reason? On the specific issue of the Electoral Commission and the Electoral Register, why does the Deputy Prime Minister think that the Chinese Government act what is a publicly available database? Does he believe that they were after details of those who may not be on the public register for very good reasons, uh, because, for example, they might be employed in security-sensitive areas? Does he believe they were after details of political donors and their personal uh, data or for some other uh, motive? Now, he referred to the democratic uh, electoral process, and with an election coming, it is, of course, vital that people have confidence in their ability to register and to vote. Uh, can he confirm that the electronic register to vote system that we have is sufficiently well protected? In terms of attacks on parliamentary accounts, the Secretary of State said that the attacks were unsuccessful. But does he believe that China now wants to engage in the kind of hack and leak activity that we have in recent years associated with Russia in order to compromise either individual politicians or the wider democratic process. On the issue of sanctions, only last week the Minister of State was reluctant to respond to the claim that the Foreign Office had indefinitely paused targeted sanctions against Chinese officials late last year. Can the Deputy Prime Minister explain what has changed just in the past week? Uh, now, Mr Speaker, we are very grateful for the work of the Intelligence and Security Committee and the report they issued on China last year, which covered much of the same ground as the Deputy Prime Minister has covered in his statement today. Paragraph 98 of that report, when discussing individual politicians, said the following, and I quote, targets are not limited to serving politicians either. They can include former political figures if they are sufficiently high profile. For example, it is possible that David Cameron's role as Vice President of a £1 billion China-UK investment fund was in some part engineered by the Chinese state to lend credibility to Chinese investment. Close quote. What has the government done to look into this allegation from the Intelligence and Security Committee. How can ministers ensure that those leaving politics are not targeted in the way that the committee discussed? And in that spirit, Mr Speaker, I've read reports that the Conservative Backbench 1922 Committee is to be briefed on these matters later today. Given the importance of national and democratic security to all the parties in this House. Is the Deputy Prime Minister intending to arrange a briefing for the Leader of the Opposition, 
the Intelligence and Security Committee or indeed the other political parties represented in this House. Experts in this field have warned of China's voracious appetite for data and the potential uses of this as computing power improves, for example, as quantum computing develops. Now, the UK's record on data security is patchy, to put it mildly. What is the government doing to protect complex and valuable data sets from being stolen now, possibly in order to be manipulated later by more powerful computers that are controlled by authoritarian adversaries? And finally, Mr Speaker, on the broader issue, does the fact that the Deputy Prime Minister chose to make this statement today signal a fundamental reassessment of the overall threat? He referred to the United States and our allies. On the 12th of February, the United States administration warned Congress that the cyber threat from China was changing. Previously, a threat that largely involved spying and influencing now looked like it was getting ready to disrupt critical American infrastructure, aviation, energy, healthcare, and other sectors. Is it now the UK's government view that we should change our assessment of the threat in a similar way? If so, this is of the utmost importance, and we would need to know what corresponding improvements the government would make to the preparedness of our critical infrastructure because if the threat really has changed, then so too should our response. Yeah. Well, I, I thank the honourable gentleman for his questions. I'll seek to address as many of them as I, I can. When it comes to um, Chinese motivations, ultimately uh, it's a matter for the, the, the Chinese to be able to justify their motivations. I think the points he made are both apposite. Uh, first of all, I think that the Chinese look at successful democratic countries like the United Kingdom, or indeed Japan and the Republic of Korea, where I was uh, last week, and they want to seek to undermine successful democratic countries. So it's no surprise that they should seek to interfere in electoral processes, just as you have seen conduct from, from Russia that aligns with that, and indeed uh, the, the successful democratic elections we're having around the world right now stand in contrast with the sham elections that we saw in Russia last yeah. weekend. On the point about uh, the, the, the public uh, record uh, of the Electoral Commission, I think that is the essence of what's happened here. These attacks and these attempts were ultimately pretty unsuccessful. And I would like to, to reassure the uh, honourable gentlemen and members of this House that there was uh, no infiltration of the, the closed register of the Electoral Commission, so the, the concerns he raised have not uh, arisen. In terms of further strengthening the uh, Electoral Register, that's precisely the work that the National Cyber Security Centre does in coordination with GCHQ, uh, working with uh, government agencies, including the Electoral uh, Commission. He's right to raise the uh, the, the risk of hack and leak is certainly something that we saw in previous elections. I remain concerned about hack and leak. I also remain uh, very concerned about uh, artificial intelligence being used to disrupt elections, particularly in relation to deep fakes, hence the, the work that uh, I undertook at, at the conference last week and the progress we're making with this accord in, in relation to uh, artificial intelligence use by uh, malign states. Uh, the, in relation to targeted sanctions, it's not the case that the FCDO paused targeted uh, sanctions. Uh, in relation to the, the conduct of the former, uh, or the, the current uh, foreign secretary who sits in the uh, who sits in the other place, uh, all, all appointments are. Uh, I'm not I'm not uh, sacking the, the foreign secretary from the dispatch box. The, um, uh, they are they are subject to, to the usual propriety and ethic processes for any appointments to, to government. In relation to the 1922 committee, uh, the, the Lord Cameron is uh, addressing the 1922 committee in his capacity as Foreign Secretary in the usual way, addressing a wide range of issues. It's not a specific briefing uh, on this, but if, 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 leader, if, if, if leaders of the principal opposition parties wish to have further briefing on this, uh, of course, I'm very happy to facilitate that in the way that they will know I have done in relation to other national security-related uh, uh, issues. Um, in, in relation to the, the, the risks from hostile states hoovering up 
currently quantum encrypted um, uh, information, which could then be, be, be decoded subsequently with advances in quantum computing. We are highly alert to this, uh, and we do extensive work with the National Cyber Security Centre and uh, with the Ministerial Cyber Board on critical national infrastructure to make sure we guard ourselves against exactly uh, that risk. Uh, in terms of our, our relationship with uh, China more broadly, I think members of this House should take this moment very seriously. It is a grave uh, moment, uh, and, we will not, and it is in a ba against the backdrop of an escalating threat from China. And we will take proportionate action in response to that escalating threat. Yeah, yeah. Sir Ian Duncan Smith. Mr. Speaker, um, tomorrow is three years since uh, the parliamentarians were sanctioned, and your defence, Mr. Speaker, of us has been remarkable. But what I will say is that whilst I welcome these two sanctions uh, from the government, it is a little bit, this statement, like an elephant giving birth to a mouse. The reality is that in those three years, uh, the Chinese have trashed the Sino-British agreement. They have been committing murder and slave labour and genocide in Xinjiang. We have had churches broken and, in Hong Kong, false uh, uh, court cases against Jimmy Lai. So my question really is to my right honourable friend, why two? America has sanctioned over 40 people in Hong Kong. We have sanctioned none and three lowly officials only in Xinjiang. Surely this means that the integrated review should now be changed. They are not an epoch-defining challenge, strange as that may be, but they are surely a threat, and can they now correct that so that we all know where we are with China? Well, uh, I thank my right friend for his question, and his, his views are very well known to me, uh, Mr Speaker, and uh, I genuinely uh, welcome a constructive, at most times, debate that I have with the uh, right and gentleman. But nobody should be in any doubt about the gravity of this matter. They're not the actions of a friendly state, and they do require our serious attentions. This, as has been described by the right and gentleman, is an escalating situation. The measures we've announced today are the first step, but the government will respond proportionately at all times to, in relation to the facts in front of it. But no one should be in any doubt about the government's determination to face down and deal with these threats to our national security from wherever they come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kirsty Blackman, SNP spokesperson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> I thank the Deputy Prime Minister for his statement and for the advance sight of it. During the statement, he said, I have taken steps to reduce the government's exposure to Chinese operators, banning Hikvision and TikTok from government buildings and devices. But the reality is that the Hikvision ban only extends to sensitive sites, despite the fact that we have pushed him to try to ensure that it extends to all public buildings, because surely the majority of things that happen in government involve some sort of confidential information. Um, can the Deputy Prime Minister confirm whether he is extending this ban beyond sensitive sites to all government sites, as we have been calling for for a number of years now? Mr. Speaker, these attacks referenced on the Electoral Commission and the parliamentarian accounts happened nearly three years ago. Will we be sitting here in 2027 hearing about an attack that's happening right now? Yes. Um, the EU is currently de delivering €214 million Euros for cybersecurity to improve their collective resilience. Will the government deliver an equivalent fund for these islands? Without more action, Mr Speaker, can the Deputy Prime Minister give us real assurances that the general election that is going to take place this year will take place without international inter interference? Uh, well, well, in respect to the points the Honourable Lady raises, uh, as she is aware, we, we currently ban Hick vision from, and indeed it's not just Hick vision, it's other, any Chinese uh, technology in relation to sense uh, to, uh, 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 in, in, in relation uh, to CCTV. Uh, we continue to keep that under review. I don't rule out a, a further uh, progression in the policy, but that's, that's not the case right now. In terms of the time taken, and this is an important point, it's really essential that before government ministers stand at this dispatch box and make assertions 
attributing to a hostile state the, the conduct uh, of, of this kind of activity, we are absolutely sure of the basis on which we do it. So that requires extensive work by our intelligence agencies, it requires fine judgments to be made, and it requires work to be done with our allies around the world, and you will see comments from the United States shortly after my statement. So I would rather we did this in the, the proper way. In relation to our investment, in fact, we have invested £2.6 billion during this spending review, £2.6 billion on uh, cyber security. So I, I can never be totally confident in relation to, to cyber security. No government minister anywhere in the world can be. This is a, an environment in which the risks are escalating all the time. They are being turbocharged by artificial intelligence. But I can assure the Honourable Lady and other members of this House that we are constantly increasing our activity and our vigilance in the face of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jim right hon. Friend for Chingford, I too am rather underwhelmed by this uh, statement. In the three years since we have been sanctioned, we have been the seven parliamentarians subject to intimidation, impersonation, hacking, as well as the families of exiles from China who we have associated uh, uh, with us. Today, the Minister has described hostile actors, malign acts towards the integrity of our electoral system and parliamentary democracy, foreign interference and sanctioned two individuals and one entity which is a company which employs 50 people with a turnover of £208,000. So does the Minister think that this is proportionate? And specifically, can the Minister confirm that the Government will be putting the whole of the Chinese Communist Government in the enhanced tier of the Foreign Influence Registration Scheme? Well, in, in relation to the enhanced tier of the Foreign uh, Interference Registration Scheme, uh, the Honourable Gentleman may, may be aware that uh, we are currently uh, in the process of collective government agreement in relation to it. Clearly, the, uh, the, the, act, the conduct I have described today will have a very strong bearing on the decision that, that we make in respect of it. In relation to the sanctions, it is worth noting this is the first time that the government has imposed sanctions in respect of cyber activity. I do believe these are proportionate and targeted, but they also sit, they also sit uh, in the context of actions that we have been taking with our international allies. They are a first step, and uh, as the situation evolves, we remain totally open to taking further steps. It is clear the path we are going on with this. And my first reaction, Mr Speaker, is that's it, yeah. Yeah. because uh, the spin clearly didn't match uh, this uh, statement. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister says that uh, there's an issue around nuclear and uh, uh, higher education. Well, the reason for that is, is because the government encouraged China to actually invest in nuclear and cut the budgets of our universities, so they're reliant on Chinese yeah. students. Yeah. Yeah. He also ducked the question asked by uh, my uh, right hon. from the front bench about Lord Cameron. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, will he now publish all yeah. the money and interactions he had with the Chinese, Chinese entities when he was out of government? And he actually says he's committed to uh, the um, uh, security services. Can I ask him then why, that in the budget on the 6th of March, the security budget was cut by £600 million pounds yeah. next year? That is not a sign of a government that has taken this issue very yeah, seriously. Yeah. Well, the, the Foreign Secretary has provided a full declaration of all of his uh, interests. I, I, I will take with a pinch of salt from the benches opposite lectures on action in relation to security threats. It was this government that introduced the National Security Investment Act in 2021. It was this government that passed the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Act in 2023. It is this government that has passed the National Security Act in 2023, none of which we saw from the party opposite during their years in office. Yeah. Right. Mr. Speaker, we have seen reports of espionage on UK campus, aggression on UK soil, massive cyber attacks and uh, hostile corporate takeovers. It's abundantly clear that China is a hostile state and poses an unprecedented threat to our national security. As Home Secretary, I oversaw the enactment of the National Security Act, which built the Foreign Influence Registration Scheme, designed specifically to deal with these threats so that our authorities have the right powers to tackle them. Isn't there a compelling case for China to be listed on that register? Yep. And if not now, then when? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
and I, by the way, I pay tribute to the uh, right on rule uh, lady for the work that she did, and she and I worked closely together on many of those uh, things. The, uh, there is a strong case for it. Uh, sh the right on lady will be aware of the process that we go through in, in determining that it has to be agreed through a collective government uh, agreement. Now, on this point about the hostile state, though, I do disagree with the right on lady. It is not the case that any Five Eyes nation has designated China. Uh, explicitly a hostile state. The language I have used in relation to China reflects the complex situation of, of the state of China, but I want colleagues to be in no doubt about the direction that government policy is taking, how gravely we take this, and the, the overall escalation of our stance on this. Um, Angela Eagle. Thank you uh, very much, Mr Speaker. I, too, am quite surprised at the difference between uh, what was briefed and some of the information that the Deputy Prime Minister has given us today and the action and the sum of the action. He said that the government had taken rapid and robust action when he was talking about things that happened three and four years ago and the sanctioning of two individuals in a minor company doesn't seem to be the definition of robust <laughs> to me. Uh, how uh, does he think that taking such tiny steps will actually deter the Chinese from carrying on in the same way as they have been doing, which has been very clear from the China report that the ISC uh, was finally allowed to publish late. How will uh, these tiny steps that he's announced today actually deter the Chinese from continuing in exactly the same way as he's uh, outlined? Well, well, first of all, in relation to, to briefings, I can assure you, Mr Speaker, and I can assure members of this House that there's been no briefing whatsoever from me or from my department in respect to this. I, I, can, I, can, categorically, I can categorically assure you. So, uh, but as ever, I would say don't believe everything that you read in the newspapers. Now, uh, in, in, relation, in, relation to the, uh, in relation to the overall direction of, of government policy, uh, it is clearly set. It is not just the case of offensive action, but it is a case of the extensive defensive action we have taken to continuously increase uh, the security of our government systems. Uh, I make no apology for the time we have taken to properly call out to China in respect to this. I want to make sure that when I stand here at the dispatch box, I am able to do so on a solid basis, painstakingly uh, put together by uh, our allies and by our security agencies. Yeah. Who should we go? Former Attorney General, no less. Sir Mike Leather. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The front page of The Telegraph today reports Whitehall sources saying that China, Russia and Iran are even fuelling disinformation about the Princess of Wales to destabilise the nation. Now, hostile states with leaders who fake their own elections and are hated by their own people are spreading wild conspiracy theories about the royal family, amongst many other things, our royal family, which is hugely popular and much loved. Now, would the Deputy Prime Minister agree with me that British people will obviously ignore uh, this grotesque disinformation, despite the pathetic attempts of, um, of, the, of, the, uh, of those autocratic regimes? Well, I, I thank my right honourable friend for raising this issue, and I uh, would like to begin by extending uh, my best wishes to members of the royal family at this very uh, difficult time. Uh, the appalling speculation that we have seen uh, over the past uh, few weeks comes as a reminder to us all that it is important for us to ensure that uh, we deal with valid and trusted information and that we are appropriately sceptical about many online sources. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As one of the parliamentarians targeted, can I thank the security officials for the work they did to repel this attack? I'm glad it wasn't successful. Uh, but I have to say, uh, Mr Speaker, the Deputy Prime Minister has turned up at a gunfight with a wooden spoon. Yes. The attack that he stood at the dispatch box and announced happened three years ago, but he comes to the House and calls it swift. Yep, exactly. He comes to the House and says he's taken robust action. But as my honourable friend mentioned earlier, the entity he sanctioned has fewer than 50 employees and a turnover of £200,000 a year. He hasn't sanctioned a single Chinese yeah. state official. Yeah. Yeah. He hasn't even told the House whether or not the Chinese What's ambassador the has been summoned after what he's come to no, the dispatch box to tell us. 
to tell us today. Oh, forgive me, he says he has been summoned. My apologies. But can I, can, I ask the, can I ask the Deputy Prime Minister, or rather press the Deputy Prime Minister, on the enhanced tier for the foreign uh, influence registration scheme, what possible good excuse could there be for not having China in that? And isn't it the case that if we don't take more robust action and see a proper sea change in government thinking, rather than this tinkering around the edges, this will happen more and more and get worse and worse? Here. Well, I think everything about the Honourable Gentleman's question suggests that he didn't actually listen to the statement I made. I, I said that there had been a démarche, and that, uh, that's exactly what's happening. Uh, I've already set out the, the position in relation to the, the foreign uh, registration system. Greg Clough. Indeed, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister knows that cyber attacks on UK institutions come from a wide range uh, of actors, states and criminals, as we saw in the recent big attack on the British Library. It's important that our laws are up to date to protect against this. Now, in, 90, in 2022, the Government announced that it would update the Network and Information Systems Regulations 2018 to, and I quote, protect essential and digital services against increasingly sophisticated and frequent cyber attacks, both now and in the future. In 2022, it was to be done as soon as parliamentary time allowed. Why has it not been done, and when will it be? Uh, well, the, the work is pretty much complete, and as soon as parliamentary time allows, we'll be bringing forward those, those measures. Sir Christopher Bryant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I'm sorry. I found the Deputy Prime Minister today utterly unconvincing. Um, the, the idea that SWIFT means taking three years to, to publish something which has already been published by a committee of this House is utterly preposterous. It means that if there were an attempt this year, we would hear about it long after the general election and possibly after another general election after that. The truth is, if he actually thinks that this is the sum total of all the Chinese state's attempts on to disrupt the British democratic system, he's willfully blind and is therefore dangerous. There are two things, you know, that the, that the government could do immediately to enhance confidence in this area. First of all, is, make, is bring forward the motion to allow the Foreign Secretary to answer questions in this House from members of the House of Commons, and secondly, publish the full unexpurgated Russia report. Well, um, I'm, I'm sorry that you're not happy with the right hon. gentleman sitting to my, my right hand side. I think he does an excellent job of answering, uh, answering questions uh, to, uh, to this House. Uh, in, in relation to the, the, the time that it is taken, there is a difference between uh, acknowledging, uh, as the Electoral Commission did, the fact that the attack had taken place, and the process of attribution, which takes a longer period of time for the reasons that I've set out repeatedly from this dispatch box. Sir Alex Shelburne. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to have the British Library in my constituency at Boston Spa, and I, at Thorpe Arch, and I um, will be meeting with them in um, a, a week's time um, to talk about the cyber attack. And that's just one aspect, which has happened very recently. But we're talking about the protection of democracy as well, and it does concern me at the time frames in which we're moving on some issues. Um, one of the big concerns is going to be deep fake news profiles, people alleged to have been saying things, videos of yeah. people alleged to be doing things at the next election. And I urge my um, right hon. Friend to work now to try and establish procedures that everybody across this House on all sides will be able to call out efficiently fake news that may be used to try and influence the election because, as my own friend said, you've got to be careful what you believe, but what can people believe in unless there are robust systems to call out what is absolutely fake? Oh. <clears throat> well, my honourable friend is absolutely right to uh, raise this issue. We are doing a work with tech companies in relation to, for example, watermarking of, uh, of images to make sure that people have a sense of whether they're real or not. It can't just, though, be uh, action from the UK government. We have to work internationally, which is why uh, at the Global Summit for, for Democracy we launched this uh, Global Government Compact on countering deceptive use of AI by foreign states in elections. That's the United Kingdom uh, leading across nations around the world to make sure we can act in coordination to address it. Moreover, it is also the case that 
everyone in this uh, rapidly evolving technological world needs to be mindful of the information that they see and it cannot be trusted in the way it might have been able to be trusted just a few years ago. Richard Ford. Speaker, the Deputy Prime Minister has talked in his statement this afternoon about the powerful strength of our collective voices. If we contrast the sanctions that have been announced this afternoon with uh, those that followed the Novichok poisoning in 2018, yeah. on that occasion 130 Russian diplomats yeah. were expelled from yeah. over 25 countries and the exactly. EU ambassador to Moscow was withdrawn. What steps is the government taking to seek to coordinate a robust response to this alleged yeah. attack on democracy by working with our democratic allies? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's exactly what we're doing. I, I raised it with uh, opposite numbers in both Japan and Korea when I was there. Uh, I've raised it with the United States. The United States, will, uh, with whom we have been coordinating exceptionally closely, will be uh, shortly, if not uh, currently, uh, making a statement in relation to their actions. This is precisely why we've proceeded in this way, to make sure that we don't just act alone. We act with like-minded states. I would say not just what's interesting, it's not just in relation to Five Eyes, it's relation, in relation to European partners uh, and uh, international partners, particularly in the Asia-Pacific. It requires this kind of coordinated action, and this is at a time when uh, our democratic institutions, uh, not just here but around the world, are under increased threat. So it's important that those democratic nations work together in concert, and that's exactly what we're doing. Mark Pritchard. Can I join the Deputy Prime Minister in paying tribute to all those that do so much in the UK intelligence community? <coughs> Would you join me in reassuring the uh, shadow uh, front bench that the Lord Cameron in another place actually uh, oversees GCHQ right now and SIS and is probably in a good place to know what's uh, going on? Um, there's, been reference, there's been reference to the China report published. I was one of the co-authors of one or two others in this uh, chamber in July 2023. And in that report, on a page 198, it talked about the UK security services facing, quote, a formidable challenge, end quote. Can I welcome the fact that the government has played catch up? That was another criticism that the government uh, was playing catch up. It has, played, uh, it has caught up to a certain extent and particularly welcome over the last three years, £2.6 billion going to cyber protection for our cr critical national infrastructure. Because we, the furnace to the Deputy Prime Minister did want to finish early because of other things that are happening around the world. If he's happy to continue, I'm happy to keep. In which case, let's carry on. Come on forward. Yep. Forgive me. I, I think my. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I will regret saying that, Mr. Speaker. But um, the. Uh, I think the. Uh, my, my honourable friend is absolutely right to pay tribute to our intelligence agencies, and I see it firsthand, day in, day out. We are one of a very small number of countries around the world that actually uh, have intelligence agencies of this standard. It enables us all to be more secure. Mr. Ben Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome the uh, tone of, uh, of, of, of vigilance. Uh, a stark contrast to the nonchalance shown by the Johnson government over Russian interference earlier in our elections and the Brexit uh, referendum. But why should we believe the government's honest intentions when they still haven't implemented all the recommendations of the Russia report? Uh, well, I, I think the uh, right honourable gentleman would have seen from the conduct of the government, for example, just uh, a few months ago, the further sanctions that we imposed on Russia. We have not hesitated in taking robust action in relation to Russia, just as we will continue to do in relation to any threats from China. Richard Drax. Speaker, bearing in mind all that my right honourable friend has said, he may be concerned to hear what we've heard in the Defence Committee, and that is that English MOD uh, companies are having a a nightmare to employ those with AI speciality skills from university because they're all Chinese. Is my right hand friend aware of this and what's he going to do to counter this potential threat to our security? Well, well clearly anyone uh, employed by a, a relevant defence company or in a uh, UK government will be subject to uh, advanced vetting that, that would, would likely preclude uh, a, a number of the individuals that he's uh, described. The main thing we've got to do is increase our skills in this country, which is why we're investing in science, technology, uh, engineering and maths. I would say, though, we are 
very, very fortunate. And when, wherever I go in the world, people look with envy on the fact that we have three or four of the top ten universities in the world yeah. in the United Kingdom. That is a base upon which both our intelligence agencies and industry can draw. Thank you. Mr Speaker, we really must ask the question that these are cyber attacks that occurred in 2021 and 2022. How has it taken the government so long to come with this statement today? And when we reflect on what the Deputy Prime Minister said, and I quote, these actors gained access to the Electoral Commission's email and file sharing system, which contain copies of the Electoral Register. Mr Speaker, this is an election year. It should put fear into the hearts of all of us that the Chinese, at a time like this, have got access to the UK <laughs> Electoral Register, when we're already worried about bad actors, about cyber attacks taking place, about the use of AI. And when the government, the Deputy Prime Minister talks about taking robust action, good grief, two individuals being sanctioned. Reference has been made to what happened after Novichok, and we swiftly took action to expel diplomats from this country and around the world. I hope that when the Chinese ambassador meets with the Deputy Prime Minister, he will be told that diplomats will be getting expelled. And will the Deputy Prime Minister come back to this House tomorrow and tell us about the robust action that he should be taking? Ah. You shouting with robustness. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I think I will answer my question in a slightly less a, a, aggressive way than the, the, the question was put. Uh, but I will I'll make my point in my own way. First of all, in relation to the Electoral Commission, uh, as the Electoral Commission said in its statement, uh, the data contained in the Electoral Register is limited and much of it is already in the, the, the public domain. The Electoral Commission had already declared the fact of the uh, attack. What is different today is we are, contrary indeed to some of the speculation at the time, we are, um, we, we are uh, announcing that it was in relation to uh, Chinese-related uh, uh, actors. That's, that's what's changed. In relation to our, our overall uh, approach. I've set out a direction. These are grave threats that we take seriously. We are taking proportionate action now, and we will continue to take steps as required. Sir Desmond Swain. A successful deterrent requires, first, the capability, and second, the will to retaliate. Have we got either? <laughs> uh, Yes, we do on uh, both fronts, and uh, he, he will be, uh, the Honourable Gentleman will be well aware, my Honourable Friend will be well aware of our Cyber Defence Force, but I do not comment on the conduct of that from the dispatch box. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In January 2023, Lord Cameron of Chipping Norton, uh, prior to his appointment as Foreign Secretary, of course, went to Sri Lanka in order to drum up investment for Port City Colombo a Belt and Road project that was launched by President Xi and which many believe will become a military base for the Chinese Navy. Following his appointment as Foreign Secretary, many uh, FOI requests have been submitted to the FCDO in order to try and shed some light on Lord Cameron's uh, visit to Sri Lanka. Who did he meet? What kind of conversations took place? To date, not a single one of those FOI requests has been complied with by the FCDO. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with me that this is a matter of the highest public interest, yep. that sunlight is the best form of disinfectant, yeah. and therefore that the FCDO should comply with those FOI requests as a matter of urgency? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, um, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, always deals with uh, FOI requests in the proper way. I have to say that this is... This is pretty desperate stuff, trying to link uh, Chinese cyber attacks to our, our current Foreign Secretary. It just doesn't wash. It's absolutely right that we call out these malicious actions, otherwise they will become normalised. Would the Deputy Prime Minister agree that when it comes to our security, indeed our economic interests as well, there's a, a, an important parity between the digital space and indeed our traditional physical terrain, and that should be reflected in defence spending. Would you also agree that the Beijing is no doubt watching today's events and will doubt, no doubt retaliate? Should we brace ourselves for further individual sanctions against British personnel? Uh, <clears throat> well, the, my, uh, my right hand friend is, is, is absolutely right. First of all, to highlight the need for investment in this, that's precisely why in the last spending review period we put in 2.6 billion pounds in relation to our wider cyber defences. What I would say is in respect of uh, any retaliatory action uh, by Beijing, I am absolutely confident that uh, we will be able to deal with those very effectively. Alison Thewlis. Thank you, 
Mr Deputy Speaker, it's, not, it's in various areas of government that we should be worried about Chinese influence. Graham Barrow, the company's house e expert, has been warning, warning for quite some time about dubious company and corporations which have originated in China. He believes that they are being created using an algorithm and there's evidence that companies are being incorporated using stolen UK credentials, streets at a time. So can I ask uh, the, the Minister, what conversations has he had with Companies House and would he be willing to meet with Graham Barrow to hear his conclusions on this? Here, here. Uh, well, I or another minister would be very happy to uh, meet with him. That, that's precisely why we set up the National Cyber Security Centre. The National Cyber Security Centre takes GCHQ uh, expertise, uh, which informs our approach to, to cyber and allows uh, the NCSC to engage with businesses and with individuals. And again, around the world, this is a, a, a renowned and admired approach, the fact that we can give this high-quality advice through the National Cyber Security Centre. And week after week, I get delegations coming in from around the world to see what we've done with the National Cyber Security Centre. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The £2.6 billion in additional money to counter cyber threats is very welcome. But of course, this field is one that is constantly evolving and those that wish us harm innovating further. So whilst I accept my right hand friend won't comment on the exact detail, can he at least assure the House that that 2.6 billion outguns what those who wish us harm are spending on new threats? Uh, well, I think the amount of spending that, that we have compares extremely favourably uh, with similar countries uh, around the world, G7 uh, countries. I'm confident that we have world-leading expertise and that we are constantly evolving our capabilities in this space. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Deputy Prime Minister for his statement and also for his answers? The, the, I, I had occasion uh, uh, just over a month or five weeks ago to go and see Mr Speaker in relation to to an incident that took place, uh, and I want to quote it as well. The Minister may be aware, and if not, he will be aware shortly, that the uh, APPG for Freedom of Religious Belief that I chair uh, uh, for had their website hacked as well, uh, and the text which questioned human rights violations by China, and it was removed. I, I reported that to, to Mr Speaker and made him aware of, of what it took place. It is clear that nothing whatsoever is sacred to them. And the work of this House by the elected members of this House is not treated with respect. So, will the Deputy Prime Minister commit to stop handling the Chinese uh, oversteps, for want of a better description, with kids' gloves and instead with authority, and help them to understand very clearly that they will not trample over democracy in this place or others without being held accountable to the very strictest terms? Yes, we will certainly hold them to account in the way that the uh, Honourable Gentleman describes. And in relation to the uh, attack he describes, I will very happily make sure both parliamentary authorities and the National Cyber Security Centre are in touch with him about it. So, Geoffrey Clifton Brown. Deputy Speaker, we do know that the legacy systems, uh, IT systems, are the most likely to be attacked in cyber. Uh, has the Deputy Prime Minister, would he and has he, ordered an inventory to be taken of all government IT equipment to see where particularly vulnerabilities lie? Yes, is the answer. and I think uh, my hon. Friend is absolutely right to raise this issue. The first step is to properly understand where those uh, vulnerabilities lie. We have undertaken extensive work to ensure we know where risks lie, and we are putting in place measures to remediate those risks. Chris Law. Speaker, this is too little and too late. It is reactive, not proactive. Two lowly officials get sanctioned when half the UK population's data and electoral roll gets uh, cyber attacked. Just to give you a quick quote to remind you how serious this is, and I don't feel it's been taken seriously enough. Just in October last year, MI5 warned, and I quote, of epic scale of Chinese espionage, reporting more than 20,000 people in the UK having been convertly approached online by Chinese spies. And our own Commons Intelligence and Security Committee said China was, and I quote, prolifically and aggressively targeted in the UK and had managed to successfully penetrate every sector of the UK's economy. So my question is very simple. How can any one of us and anyone outside of here, and including entire society, trust the UK government when it's far too late and it does very little about what needs to be done? 
I, I simply don't accept that characterisation. When it was this government that set up the National Cyber Security Centre, this is it's this government that set up the Ministerial Cyber Board. It's this government that's invested £2.6 billion into our cyber defences. And I have consistently warned about the cyber threats facing the United Kingdom uh, time after time again, and we are taking steps to address those. Bob Seeley. Deputy Speaker, every time the Deputy Prime Minister comes here, and he's very eloquent in, in the plans that he lays out, he's more assertive, and we're doing this bit new and that bit new as we react to the threat. Isn't there an issue, though, that we still need to have a much greater sense of coherence across all government departments about how we deal with this threat, whether it's students, whether it's protection of Hong Kong citizens, whether it's intellectual property, or whether it's cyber attacks? Uh, well, I think um, my uh, honourable friend raised an important point, and I pay tribute to the work that he's done in this space, and I've, I've discussed it with him on many occasions. He is right that the, the UK government, in common with US government and others around the world, has evolved enormously in its approach to China. The sort of China that we had hoped for even a decade ago is not the China we have now, whether it's in relation to Hong Kong, whether it's in relation to Xinjiang or elsewhere. Uh, we are continuing to increase our efforts, and in the area that uh, the Honourable Gentleman describes, that's precisely why we set up the Defending Democracy Task Force, which is being led by my right honourable friend, the Security Minister. And Oswald. Deputy Speaker, the Deputy Prime Minister is right to address these issues and, as he said, to call it out. But I, I don't think calling it out really cuts the mustard here. There is certainly no appearance of urgency. And th there is a worrying sense of nothing to see here in some of his responses. He did reference human rights. We, we know well the issues there, including the horrific forced labour and worse that the Uyghur population face. Then the action that he is outlining on all of these fronts is very underwhelming and actually a bit baffling in that regard. So I wonder, does the Deputy Prime Minister think that the large number of members all across this House today, who are obviously very much underwhelmed by his statement, are all wrong? Or does he think it's possible that the content of his statement is somehow missing the mark? Well, first of all, I think it's very important to, to remember that ultimately, and I want to reassure the House and the public, that these attempts were unsuccessful. I'm not being complacent. I'm setting out the facts in terms of the risk whether it was at Cyber UK in Belfast last year, when I warned that cyber threats continue to come from the usual suspects, Russia, China, Iran or North Korea, whether it's in relation to government security conference, where I called out Russian state interference, whether it's in relation to creating secure by design, we have not hesitated to take action and we will continue to take action. Speaker, democracy is not perfect, but the right to choose the people who make the laws that govern us is a really precious right, and it is really scary to hear that a foreign power might be trying to intervene on this. Mr Deputy Speaker, as one of the few women who have spoken in this statement, I want to remind you again how concerned I am about the threats and harassment that women get when standing for Parliament, especially as we get closer to election. As well as cyber security, I am very concerned about physical security. Two and a half years ago, my Essex neighbour was murdered at his constituency surgery. Last Friday, at my constituency surgery, the security operatives recommended by this Parliament failed to show up for the second time this year. So I am very grateful to the Deputy Prime Minister for recently putting extra money into security for both parliamentarians and candidates. But can you look again at the workings of this House and how our security is governed? Because that funding is not getting to those of us on the front line. Well, I, uh, I think my right-hand friend raises a concerning uh, allegation which I will take up from the government side working with House authorities. Uh, as, as she will be aware, uh, we do take this threat exceptionally seriously, which is why we agreed an unprecedented increase in protective security for members of this House and other elected representatives. This is something we should all take very seriously, not least in the light of the two appalling uh, murders of parliamentarians that I've seen in my time in this House. Yeah. Jim Barron. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. When it comes to matters of 
national security like this, my temptation clearly is surely to work cross-party and to have a unified face on this. <laughs> All the same, doesn't the Deputy Prime Minister understand that the relative weakness of the response to this terrible attack, series of attacks, when combined then with his evasiveness over questions around the financial interests of the Foreign Secretary, are bound to increase people's concerns. It is understood that Lord Cameron still has close links to the Chinese state with numerous business ventures, and we also know, for example, that it was reported last week that the government has secretly softened its policy against Chinese uh, businesses implicated in human rights abuses. So will he strengthen his response and demonstrate by his actions and by transparency that this soft pod peddling is nothing suspicious? <coughs> well, the, the Honourable Gentleman stands up and says we should have a cross-party approach that immediately uh, uh, seeks on political grounds to denigrate the Foreign Secretary and turn this into a party political matter. Yeah. I'm afraid he has to choose to one approach or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, when we think ahead to the election, one of the points that's been raised today is about artificial intelligence and the threat to democracy. We often talk about the concept of deep fake news. It used to be fake news, uh, but it's not just about deep fakes. It's the risk of rumour bombs happening to get people to not go to the polls on the day. It's about voice clones where people may be phoned up to be told that they're uh, pretending to be their daughter or their family member saying, don't go and vote today. There are many risks that we may not even be aware of. And the data that we're talking about today may be used in conjunction with data from Facebook and from other places to um, pretend that they are something that they are not. So can I ask, along with the work that's going on uh, within government and with tech companies, can we also look at an education campaign to let the public know that there are better ways to be aware of the risks that they may uh, be under uh, during the election? Thank you. I, I think my own friend makes a really important point because there will always be limitations at a time with rapidly evolving technology, particularly artificial intelligence, the ability of agencies or the companies themselves to be able to call this stuff out. There needs to be greater awareness from the public about the risks and the fact that they should treat these kind of images with a much higher degree of scepticism than they did previously. And it's something I will be taking up with my colleague, the Education Secretary. Carol Moynihan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Professor Jim Saker, who is the President of the Institute of Motor Industry, has warned about the threat that Chinese manufactured electric vehicles could pose, um, giving access to big data and personal, da um, and personal information. Um, he has gone on to say that Chinese connected EVs flooding the country could be the most effective Trojan horse that the Chinese establishment has to impact the UK. Can I ask the Deputy Prime Minister what consideration he has given to the threat posed by Chinese manufactured EVs? Well, I think the Honourable Lady raises a, a very important point. Clearly, uh, any new technology or cars put on the UK market will have to meet with our uh, safety standards, and it will include an assessment of those sort of threats. So what I would say is that we also work in conjunction with the uh, National Security and Investment Act under which I can make uh, decisions to block or impose conditions on uh, any investments or transactions uh, from whichever state they, they, they come from, companies in whichever country they come from. So again, that's another tool in our weaponry which we didn't have previously. Mr. Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. My right honourable friend will no doubt be aware that the Electoral Commission failed an NCSC Cyber Essentials audit around the time that these breaches uh, occurred. Among the failings identified were staff laptops and smartphones running outdated systems, and including Windows 10 Enterprise, which at the relevant time was no longer receiving security updates. Does my right honourable friend not agree that these failings look awfully like extraordinary negligence on the part of the Electoral Commission? And how satisfied is he that they have done everything necessary to regularise their procedures? Well, I, I think the right honourable gentleman is, is right to, to highlight that, and it's precisely because of those concerns that we've ensured the Electoral Commission is working very closely with the National Cyber Security Centre to achieve a significant step up uh, in their, their capabilities uh, and their cyber resilience. Uh, it was essential that that work was undertaken, and it has been undertaken. Alexander Stafford. 
very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. In May this year, we have local elections in Rotherham, like other places across uh, the country. Now, the last local election in 2021, Labour kept control of Rotherham Council by only 54 electors. So what steps is the government putting in place to make sure when people go and cast their votes in May for the Conservatives in Rotherham, those votes are secure to end 50 years of Labour rule? Well, I... I trust and hope that they will uh, achieve that uh, outcome. I would like to uh, assure members that we have every confidence in the integrity of those uh, elections and through the Defending Democracy Task Force, through my uh, colleague, the, the, the Minister for Local Government, who has written out to all local authorities in the past week, we are ensuring that the integrity of those important elections is preserved. I'd like to thank the uh, Deputy Prime Minister for his statement today and for responding to questions for over an hour. We are now moving on to the next statement on Women's State Pension Age Report. Mel Stride. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And Mr Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I would like to make a statement to provide an interim update on the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman's investigation in the way changes to the state pension age were communicated to women born in the 1950s. I am grateful to the Ombudsman for conducting this investigation. I recognise the strength of feeling there is on this issue, and it is important to set out the wider context and our initial understanding of the report itself. The fact it has taken over five years for the Ombudsman to produce the final report reflects the complexity of this matter. The period the investigation considers spans around 30 years, dating back to the decision Parliament took in 1995 to equalise the state pension age for men and women gradually from 2010. Since then, Mr Deputy Speaker, Changes have been made through a series of Acts of Parliament by successive governments, which resulted in the state pension age rising to 65 for women by November 2018 and then to 66 by October 2020. The announcement in 1993 to equalise the state pension age addressed a long-standing inequality between men and women. These changes were about maintaining the right balance between the sustainability of the state pension, fairness between generations and ensuring a dignified retirement in later life. Women retiring today, Mr Deputy Speaker, can still expect to receive the state pension for over 21 years on average, over two years longer than for men. Had the Government not equalised the state pension age, women would have been retiring today at 60, and they could have spent, on average, over 40 per cent of their adult lives in receipt of state pension. This would have been unfair, as by the 1990s, life expectancy had significantly increased compared to 1948, when state pension age for women was set at 60. In turning to the investigation itself, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think it is important to be clear about what the Ombudsman has not said, particularly following some of the inaccurate and misleading commentary since the report was published. The Ombudsman has not looked at the decision to equalise the state pension age, but rather at how that decision was communicated by DWP. The report hinges on the Department's decisions over a narrow period between 2005 and 2007 and the effect of those decisions on individual notifications. The Ombudsman has not found that women have directly lost out financially as a result of DWP's actions, with the report stating, and I quote, we do not find that it, meaning DWP's communication, resulted in them referring to the complainants suffering direct financial loss. And the final report has not said that all women born in the 1950s will have been adversely impacted, as many women were aware their state pension age had changed. Mr Deputy Speaker, in his Stage 1 report, what the Ombudsman did find was that, and I quote, between 1995 and 2004, 
DWP's communication of changes to state pension age reflected the standards they would expect it to meet. That report also confirms that accurate information about changes to the state pension age was publicly available in leaflets through DWP's pension education campaigns, through DWP's agencies and on its website. However, when considering the DWP's actions between August 2005 and December 2007, the Ombudsman came to the view that those actions resulted in 1950s-born women receiving individual notice later than they might had different decisions been made. Mr Deputy Speaker, during the course of the Ombudsman's investigation, it is important to remember that the state pension age changes were considered by the courts. In 2019 and 2020, the High Court and the Court of Appeal respectively found no fault with the actions of DWP. The courts made clear that under successive governments dating back to 1995, the action taken was entirely lawful and did not discriminate on any grounds. During these proceedings, the Court of Appeal held that the High Court was entitled to conclude as a fact that there has been, and I quote, adequate and reasonable notification given by the publicity campaigns implemented by the Department over a number of years. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Ombudsman has taken five years to produce his final report. As the Chief Executive of the Ombudsman herself has set out, DWP has fully cooperated with the Ombudsman's investigation throughout this time and provided thousands of pages of detailed evidence. We continue to work, we continue to take the work of the Ombudsman very seriously, and it is only right that we now fully and properly consider the findings and the details of what is a substantial document. The Ombudsman has noted in his report the challenges and the complexities of this issue. In laying the report before Parliament, the Ombudsman has brought matters to the attention of the House, and we will provide a further update to the House once we have considered the report's findings. Mr Deputy Speaker, this Government has a strong track record of supporting all pensioners. In 2023-24, we will spend over £151 billion on support for pensioners. That is 5.5% of GDP. That includes around £124 billion for the state pension. We are committed to ensuring the state pension remains the foundation of income and retirement now and for future generations. That is why we are honouring the triple lock by increasing the basic and new state pensions by 8.5 per cent from next month. This sees the full rate of the new state pension rise by £900 a year and, of course, follows last year's rise of 10.1 per cent. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, we now have 200,000 fewer pensioners in absolute poverty after housing costs than there were in 2010. Our sustained commitment to the triple lock demonstrates our determination to continue to combat pensioner poverty in the future. And that brings me to it is why, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have reformed the state pension, as well as work-based pensions, improving the retirement outcomes for many women. Our commitment to pensioners is why we introduced automatic enrolment, which has seen millions more women saving into a workplace pension. Mr Deputy Speaker, this Government is committed to supporting pensioners in a sustainable way, providing them with a dignified retirement, whilst also being fair to them and to taxpayers. I have set out our strong track record of backing our pensioners. I have also set out our commitment, Mr Deputy Speaker, to the full and proper consideration of the Ombudsman's report. I note the Ombudsman has laid his final report before Parliament on this issue. Of course, I can assure the House the Government will continue to engage fully and constructively with Parliament, as we have done with the Ombudsman. Ms Kendall. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'd like to thank the Secretary of State for advance sight of his statement. 
and the Ombudsman and his staff for all their hard work. This is a serious report that requires serious consideration. The Ombudsman has rightly said it is for the government to respond, but that Parliament should also consider its findings. Members on this side of the House will look carefully at the report too and continue to listen respectfully to those involved, as we have done from the start. Now, the Secretary of State says he'll provide a further update on this matter to the House. Can I ask him when? Will he do so when the House returns after the Easter recess? Because this has been going on for years. He rightly says issues around changes in the state pension age have spanned multiple parliaments. But those of us who've been around a little while will remember the turning point which sparked the WASPI campaign was the 2011 Pensions Act, yeah. when the then Chancellor and former member for Tatton decided to accelerate increases in the state pension age yeah. with very little notice. His comment that this, and I quote, probably saved more money than anything else we've done, understandably angered many women. And at the time, Labour put forward amendments to the Act which would have ensured proper notice was given to women so they could plan for their retirements, which would have gone some way to dealing with this problem. Now, the Ombudsman began investigating how changes in the state pension age were communicated in 2019. In the same year, the High Court ruled the Ombudsman could not recommend changes in the state pension age itself or the reimbursement of lost pensions because that had been decided by Parliament. Now, the Ombudsman's final report, published last week, says in 2004, Internal research from the Department for Work and Pensions found around 40% of the women affected knew about changes to the state pension age. Does that remain the government's current assessment? What is the government's assessment of the total number of women who would receive compensation based on the Ombudsman's different options? How many are the poorest pensioners on pension credit, how many are already retired or who have sadly passed away? And when he rises, can the Secretary of State spell out why, given the Department already knew there were problems communicating changes in the state pension age, did his government press ahead with changes in the 2011 Pension Act in the way that they did and in the way that sparked this campaign? Now, the government is currently committed to providing 10 years' notice of future changes to the state pension age. But Labour's 2005 Pension Commission called for 15 years' notice. Has the government considered the merits of a longer time frame and how they would improve communications in future? Labour is fully committed to guaranteeing information about any future changes to the state pension age are provided in a timely and targeted way and, wherever possible, tailored to individual needs. Will the government now do the same? One crucial thing the Secretary of State admitted to say is that the Ombudsman says he has taken the rare decision to ask Parliament to intervene on this issue because he strongly doubts the Department will provide a remedy. In light of these concerns, and in order to aid Parliament in its work, will the Secretary of State now commit to laying all relevant information about this issue in the House of Commons Library including all impact assessments and related correspondence. So lessons can be learnt and so members from across this House can properly do their job because our current and future pensioners deserve nothing less. Well, th thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And could I thank uh, the Right Honourable Lady for her response, not least on the points of agreement that appear 
to be between us. That there are strong feelings. We accept that. Uh, there is complexity around these issues. She is quite right to raise the point that they must be given very serious consideration, as she put it, and that we should listen respectfully to all those around all the issues that this matter uh, has raised. She asked uh, uh, when uh, I will be, or the Government will be returning uh, with a further update uh, to the House. I can assure her in the House there will be no undue delay uh, in doing that. Uh, she made uh, a slightly political point, I think, about the 2011 Act, and I would just very gently remind her, of course, that the Ombudsman's report focuses on that period of time between 2005 and 2007, when it was her party uh, that were actually in government at that time. She asked a series of questions, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, around uh, various assessments based upon the findings within the report. And of course, that goes to the heart of my response, which is that, and I think she agrees with this, we should look very closely at this report in order to make those uh, assessments. It has always been the position on her specific point about notice of changes to state pension age, that that should be uh, adequate. And indeed, in the last review uh, that I undertook uh, of that, there was a delay in the decision uh, for the increase of the state pension age to uh, 68 into the next parliament, amongst other reasons, to allow just for that uh, point to be addressed. What I think is particularly important now, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that we will fully engage uh, with uh, Parliament, as we did indeed uh, with the Ombudsman. On her point about the Ombudsman, uh, the Chief Executive of the Ombudsman on Sky News on Thursday, the day that the uh, report was published, stated, and I quote, the Government, the DWP, completely cooperated with our report, with our investigation, and over the period of time we have been working, they have provided us with the evidence we have asked for. That is our record in that particular matter. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, can I once again assure the House that the Government will continue to engage fully and constructively with Parliament, as we have done with the Ombudsman? Caroline Notes. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I welcome the Secretary of State's comments and my right honourable friend's emphasis that this is a very complex matter. Of course it is. But the WASPI women have been waiting five years for the outcome of the Ombudsman's report. And in his report, and indeed subsequent to his report, he wrote to various select committee chairs across the House, uh, gently encouraging us to keep a weather eye on how quickly the government was going to come forward with a solution. Now, look, I recognise that this is an interim update, but I would gently press my right honourable friend. The WASP women have been waiting five years for the Ombudsman. They won't want to wait for a select committee inquiry into this report in order to see action from the government. Well, can, can I uh, welcome my uh, right honourable friend's uh, uh, question and just reassure her, as I have just done to the House, that there will be no undue uh, delay in our approach uh, to this matter. Uh, we engaged fully with the Ombudsman. That included uh, over a 1,000 pages uh, of evidence. It included a full commentary uh, in respect of the interim uh, report that, uh, that they, they, they previous interim report that they uh, published. Uh, this report is over 100 pages in length. It is very detailed, and I think it is only right that we do, uh, in an appropriate manner, give it the due attention that it deserves. Patricia Gibson. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The timid response from the Labour Party is truly shocking. But regardless yeah. of what we've just heard, no, Waspie women at long last have been finally vindicated after five long years by the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman report. 3.8 million women were impacted, of which 270,000 have died without yeah. ever receiving their rightful pension. And despite what the Minister says, the verdict of the Ombudsman report on the DWP is damning and unequivocal, and weasel words won't change that. Yeah, yeah. Women born in the 1950s had their pension age raised with little or no notice, and there have been failings at every turn by successive UK governments. The report states these women are owed compensation. The DWP has refused to comply and must be held accountable for doing so and that there was a failure to adequately inform women of the state pension age change. Sure. And these failures, Mr Deputy Speaker, have had a devastating impact on lives, on retirements and the financial and emotional well-being of WASPY women. 
Many reduced to poverty after being robbed of tens of thousands of pounds of pension. And that suffering has been caused by and is the responsibility of this broken Westminster system and this Westminster cosy consensus. Financial redress is vital for these women in the interests of justice. Clearly, Labour are not interested in that, but what we need from the government is a commitment to prompt compensation for these women yeah. with no barriers yeah. erected to prevent access to it, which recognises their financial loss and distress. We cannot have a situation where WASPy women have their campaign for justice vindicated, yet continue to be ignored, and any attempt to do so will result in a rightful backlash. We in the SNP stand shoulder to shoulder yeah. with these women. Yeah. who have been abandoned 100%. and betrayed by the UK Government and the future Labour Government. Can the Secretary of State tell this House what it will take to compensate these women? Do we need another TV drama to embarrass and shame them yeah, into yeah. doing the right thing? These women are not going away, but the longer this injustice is left unresolved, the greater the number of WASPy women who will die without seeing their pension. Shame on this place. Yeah. Uh, well, the, um, the Honourable Lady refers to doing the right thing, and uh, I think doing the right thing by the people that the Honourable Lady uh, describes is to look very closely and carefully and diligently at this report. It has been five years in gestation. It is detailed. It runs to 100 pages. It draws upon a vast reservoir uh, of evidence. And it is only right and proper, given that the report was only published on Thursday and today is Monday, for all of us to have time to properly consider its findings. Now, the Honourable Lady refers to the general situation of pensioners. All I can say, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that I am very uh, pleased and reassured that this uh, pensions generally is a reserved matter and that we have been able to increase the state pension last year by 10.1 per cent, this coming year by 8.5 per cent, that we have pressed so hard on promoting pension credit for poorer pensioners that we had a cost of uh, living payment, that this government centrally as, an unreserved, as a reserved matter, as a reserved matter was able to provide £300 to pensioners last November alongside their winter fuel payment, and that as a consequence of that, we have order. The Honourable Lady is asked a question. Please listen to the order. Secretary of State. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I was merely pointing out, Mr Deputy Speaker, the fact that we are standing full square right across the United Kingdom, full square behind our pensioners to support them. And that is why, under this government, there are 200,000 fewer pensioners in poverty after housing costs than there were in 2010. Siobhan Bailey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Waspy women across the Stroud constituency have campaigned consistently and constructively. I have grown very fond of them over the number of years where we have had discussions about this. And as the Secretary of State knows, at the heart of this is women saying that they were left unable to plan or that their plans for their future were scuppered. So it is right that there is a focus on laying out a timetable as soon as possible. And we know that the issue of compensation is key to many of this, these women. They will have read through the report. So what I would urge the Secretary of State is that as soon as possible, I think it's right that him and his department look through this report in detail, but is able to lay out a timetable and tell these women what is and isn't possible and manage expectations as soon as possible because they have waited. Thank you. Well, Mr Deputy uh, Speaker, can I uh, welcome the, the question from my honourable friend or the member of the uh, Select Committee? Can I reassure her there will be no undue uh, delay? And can I thank her for recognising, I think quite rightly, that we do need to look at these matters with great care? And that does not mean coming forward with some of the things that the Scottish National Party may wish us to do uh, on a Monday, given that the report only landed with us on the Thursday. Chair of the Select Committee, Sir Stephen Timms. Everybody, Speaker, does the Secretary of State uh, agree with the Chair of the Women's Equality Select Committee, as I do, 
that those affected shouldn't have to wait for the outcome of a select committee inquiry before learning the government's response. The equalisation of the state pension age was legislated for in 1995, giving uh, 15 years notice to those affected. The 2011 changes, which accelerated the process, gave much less than 10 years notice to those affected. Isn't one of the lessons here of what's gone wrong is that we must make sure that major changes of this kind do provide at least 10 years, preferably 15 years notice before the changes take effect. Well, Mr Speaker, the, uh, the right hon. Gentleman, the Chair of the uh, Select Committee, raises the potential role of Select Committees in these matters, which is uh, certainly something that uh, he would have the authority to do if he were uh, minded uh, to do so. Um, it is important that what I do and my department does is to seriously consider the findings within that report before we come to our conclusions and then to uh, make sure that we come uh, to the House to uh, uh, present those uh, conclusions uh, to uh, the House. And I think that is the uh, most important point. Nigel Mills. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I have to say, having seen this report, I, you know, I think this issue has gone on long enough and we need now to choose a compensation scheme and get this, uh, uh, get this issue finished. So would the Secretary of State confirm that the Government will have made its mind up before we get the autumn fiscal event so we can see it actually set out by that date and how much the cost will be? Well, well clearly, Mr Speaker, um, as to whether there is an autumn statement at all and the date thereof is not within my, uh, my remit. Uh, and uh, uh, indeed, I, I wouldn't be absolutely certain that uh, any particular date or autumn statement is pencilled in or uh, otherwise. I think the most important thing, Mr. Speaker, is that we recognise, and the message should go out loud and clear from the dispatch box today, that there should be no undue delay in coming to the appropriate conclusions in this matter. Marsha de Cordova. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Now, this, the WASPI scandal has been a huge injustice for millions of women, including women in my own Battersea constituency. Now, the Secretary of State has said that he wants to continue to look in detail at the findings of this report, but surely he should be able to say, make an unambiguous commitment to compensation for these women. You know, the Ombudsman had to take the rare step of laying this before Parliament due to the Department refusing to comply. So, can he say today or set out a timeline as to when he will come back to this House and set out how he intends to ensure that these women are compensated fully? Well, the, the Honourable Lady is uh, uh, attempting to draw me in to coming to premature conclusions on some of the findings uh, within the report, which I'm afraid I'm not going to do for the reasons that I've already given. But once again on this issue of timing, there will be no undue delay. The Chair of the APPG, Peter Aldous. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm most grateful to my right honourable friend for his statement. The Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman is itself WASPy, having been conceived in the 1950s. Would my right honourable friend agree that a failure by government to comply with their recommendations would be almost completely unprecedented over the past 70 years and would in effect, would in effect drive a coach and horses through an integral part of our system of democratic checks and balances? And with this in mind, can, can he confirm that his department will work in full haste with Parliament to agree a mechanism for remedy and can he outline the work that he is carrying out to address the further concerns that have been raised over systematic failure by the DWP over several decades to properly communicate future pension changes? You say. Uh, well, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, at the heart uh, of this matter is the imperative need to make sure that we fully and carefully examine the findings contained uh, within the report. I'm not going to be drawn today, Mr Deputy Speaker, as to where we may uh, end up in respect of those particular findings. But on the matter uh, of Parliament that my honourable friend uh, raises, I can assure him that we will engage fully and constructively with Parliament on these matters. Emily Orbach. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. 1950s women entered into a contract with the state. 
The coalition government reneged on that, denying them their pensions. In their fight for justice, thousands have died. Since the Ombudsman's report, over 100 have passed away. Many continue to live in poverty. Shamefully, the Government are now delaying acting on the Ombudsman's findings and have remained silent today on proper compensation. Will the Secretary of State apologise for their long wait for justice? Well, on the issue of the, the 2011 Act, as the hon Honourable Lady will know from the report, uh, the window uh, which has been particularly examined and about which these considerations turn is 2005 to 2007. It was actually at the time when her party uh, was in office. But as a general point and a non-partisan non point, my view is that we owe it to all the women uh, who were born in the 1950s to properly look at this report in detail, as I have described, and to engage with Parliament at the same time in an appropriate way. Sir Jeremy Wright. Much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. My right honourable friend must be correct to refer to the complexity of this situation. One of the aspects of complexity is that what these women have suffered is the loss of an opportunity to plan appropriately for their futures. That, that is the consequence of the maladministration that the Ombudsman has identified. That, of course, will be different for each individual. So, can he say anything about the work his department will now do to think about the appropriate remedy in such diverse circumstances as these? But will he also say, in supporting what my honourable friend for Waveney put to him, that maladministration must have consequences, and therefore it is important for the government to recognise, on behalf of previous governments, that that maladministration must lead to some form of remedy? Well, my right honourable friend is absolutely right to refer, as I have done, to the complexities uh, around uh, this uh, issue. Um, he is uh, understandably attempting to draw me in to pass comment on some of the findings in the report itself, which, for the reasons I've given, uh, I, I won't be doing uh, this afternoon. Um, but can I just reassure him that whatever the conclusions or findings within the report, as I said in my statement, when these matters went to the court and to the court uh, of uh, appeal, uh, the conclusion was that, as a matter of fact, the appeals court ruled that the High Court could treat as a matter of fact that, quote, there has been adequate and reasonable notification given by the Department over a number of years. Did you, Brock? Uh, returning to that issue of maladministration, I mean that PHSO's uh, stage one report found clear maladministration in 2021 in the way the DWP communicated those changes and didn't pay attention to its own research showing 1950s born women didn't know about the changes. Uh, and almost three years on, the DWP hasn't publicly accepted those findings. So will the minister finally admit the DWP's failings in this that shortchanged those hundreds of thousands of 1950s WASPy women? Well, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, without going into drawn into much detail around the report, there is clearly uh, an important distinction between those matters that uh, have been found to be uh, maladministration and those that have been found to be a maladministration and led to injustice. But setting that apart, as I've said before, uh, I don't think it's right for me today to start dissecting elements of the report and some of the conclusions that have been arrived at. We will go away, look very carefully at these matters, and will engage with Parliament appropriately. Holly Mumbycroft. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I thank my honourable friend for the clarity with which he set out the history of this issue. He will understand that my constituents who were affected quite reasonably wish to have a similar degree of clarity on what the next steps will be and the timescales for that and it's my job to come here and communicate to him today their strength of feeling on that. I understand he said he won't be able to set out that timescale today but can he reassure the House that he has in his mind a timescale for these next steps? <laughs> well, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, as I've said on the, on the issue of timing, there should be no undue delay, but my honourable friend is absolutely right that what is required is uh, clarity, and this is why I am stressing this point, that clarity comes with careful consideration. Margaret Greenwood. 
pay tribute to all WASPy campaigners and stand in solidarity with them. I need to also declare that I am somebody who was born in the 1950s. The treatment of the 1950s born women in relation to changes to women's state pension has led to great hardship for many. One woman in my constituency struggled to feed herself and had to sell her home as a result. The impact has been devastating. It's estimated that some 270,000 WASPy women have, since, have died since the start of the campaign in 2015 and that another dies every 13 minutes. So I note the Minister's comment that there will be no undue delay. Will he return to this House immediately after recess with a firm commitment for fast and fair compensation? Here, here. So. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I think we owe it to all of those to whom the Honourable Lady refers to act without undue delay, and that is a commitment uh, that I have made, but equally to look at these matters extremely carefully and make sure we allow time to do that effectively. James Sunderland. Mr Deputy Speaker, I welcome the statement from the Secretary of State today, and I'm very grateful for it. Um, I know that he's under pressure this afternoon, but having received a lot of correspondence myself from constituents in Brattle, and of course other members have as well, um, and it's a very objective question, does he have a personal message perhaps for those who are seeking a definitive outcome? Well, I, I think my statement, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the message that we uh, recognise that these are complicated issues, that we have collaborated entirely and fully. Uh, to the satisfaction of the Chief Executive Office uh, of the Ombudsman uh, with this uh, particular inquiry and with the report, that we will study uh, its findings very carefully indeed, that we will engage with Parliament constructively as we have done with the Ombudsman. Marianne Fellows. <coughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, the Royal Society for the Relief of Indigent Gentlewomen in Scotland sounds entirely otherworldly and quite funny. However, that wasn't the case for the waspy woman who came to my surgery in 2016. She retired, expecting to get her state pension at 60, and had to apply to the society for relief, and she had to sell her home because she couldn't afford her retirement as she didn't receive her pension. So, could I ask the Secretary of State what remedies for compensation does his government consider suitable for this constituent and others that I have? And when <coughs> should DWP have known about this issue for years and years yeah, yeah. and years? Yeah. Well, the example that the Honourable Lady has given is once again one of those, uh, Mr Deputy uh, Speaker, that underlines in my mind the importance uh, of proceeding uh, with great diligence. Uh, and looking at the findings of the report in great detail. Uh, we received that report, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, as we all know, on Thursday. It is now Monday. I think it's not unreasonable, given its length and the complexity of the issues that are under consideration here, that we have the time uh, to look closely at the conclusions. John Penrose. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, can I add my voice to those calling for an urgent announcement of a redress scheme in response to this report? Um, the Secretary of State has rightly pointed out that the um, actions in question between 2005 and 2007 didn't happen on his watch, didn't happen on any Conservative government's watch. But if he delays, it will stop, he will stop being part of the solution and start becoming part of the problem himself. And he will need all the understanding and the goodwill on both sides of this House that he can possibly muster to deal with the complexities, undoubted complexities, of distinguishing between the different kinds of and levels of um, indirect loss which this, po this report points at when he comes forward with his redress scheme. So speed is vital. Well, as my um, uh, honourable friend points out, uh, timing is important, and I have made the commitment that we will proceed without undue delay. Winter. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Millions of women have suffered an injustice, including over 200,000 in Wales and 4,000 in my constituency of Cannon Valley. And while much of the Ombudsman's report is welcome, the compensation remedy is insufficient and indeed insulting. Now, in 2019, the Labour Party pledged an average payment of £15,500. It is affordable. And the government has saved in the region of 200 billion since the implementation of this. Yet the government is, still hasn't pledged 
anything at all. So please, will the Minister agree and set a specific timeline so that we can have an urgent parliamentary process so MPs can set a compensation scheme um, that will give fair, appropriate and fast compensation to these women? Well, on the issue of timing, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think I've now given that, that reply on several occasions from this dispatch box. There will be no undue uh, delay. Uh, in terms of the specific matter that the Honourable Lady raises relating to remedy, that is one of the uh, elements of the findings within the report that, of course, along with all the others, we will consider very carefully. Bob Seeley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Minister is right to highlight the commitment to the triple lock. Uh, that the state pension will rise by some £900 uh, this year, that there are fewer people in pension of poverty than ever before, and that, predictably, the failures here happened under a previous government. But, nevertheless, does he accept that hardship in principle has been caused both to WASPy women in the Isle of Wight, but also nationally, and that a solution, whilst clearly it needs to be affordable, is needed to right a wrong which has taken place? <laughs> I thank the Honourable Gentleman for uh, his question, but um, as I have been setting out, the way that we reach the point uh, which he would like us uh, to reach uh, uh, in terms of clarity, uh, that does require us to have a very close and careful look at the report. We will do that as quickly as we are able. We will not uh, introduce any undue delays. We will consult with, department, uh, with uh, Parliament in, a, in an appropriate uh, manner, as indeed we did with the Ombudsman. Hannah Bardell. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It actually isn't that difficult. The Waspy women have been screwed over by the state yeah. and they've been made to wait for years. Yeah. Now, I understand that the Ombudsman process had to be undertaken because the government made that happen, but it actually could have faced up to the reality much sooner. Yeah. So, can the Secretary of State give a guarantee to the 6,500 Waspy women in my constituency and the Waspy women across the whole of the UK? that he's not going to kick the can down the road past the next election and ah. pass the buck to the Labour Party, who can't make a promise about this either. It's not good enough to stand in solidarity and then not take action. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, on the question of timing, I have made the position extremely clear. On the question of, on the question, on the, question of uh, the fact that it took five years for the report, uh, it had to gestate for five years, there was around a two-year delay actually due to the judicial review. Uh, that then went on in the middle uh, of that process. So I think to suggest that in any way it is the government that has been holding things up uh, is really not a fair and accurate representation of what has happened. And indeed, as I have highlighted, uh, the Ombudsman uh, Chief Executive has highlighted the good level of cooperation that there has been with my department. Caroline Ansell. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank my right honourable friend for coming so swiftly to the House in the wake of the Ombudsman's report, a very important report that does, as other honourable members have said, uh, require an uh, address and require uh, a response. And I'd also like to pay tribute to the WASPy women in my own constituency of Eastbourne and the 4,000 women who have been affected by this change. And although I welcome all the very important pension reforms that he has outlined uh, today, of which we can be very proud, it is worth remembering in this moment that in terms of dependence on that state pension, 68% uh, of women born in the 1950s have relied on this, yeah. as opposed to 44% of their male counterparts. Because of baked-in inequalities that they've experienced in much younger years, they started work before equalities legislation. They weren't able to join pension schemes back in the day and made very definite choices about their caring responsibilities. So for all of these reasons, I would urge, I do see this as a very specific uh, case, and I do see a very real injustice. And I do hope when he does talk us through how this will be uh, dealt with in Parliament, that there will be a role for MPs, individual MPs, who've worked very closely with their WASPy women to make representation on their behalf. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I can reassure the Honourable Lady that we will continue to engage with Parliament closely, as indeed we have done to date, and as indeed we did also with the uh, Ombudsman. She raises quite fairly and reasonably gender pension gaps. It is this Government that has brought in an encouraged automatic uh, enrolment, and we have 
uh, consulted on some further changes that we are considering at the moment, which has led to a narrowing of that gap as it relates uh, to private uh, pensions. There's always going to be uh, more to do, but we are uh, definitely serious about making further progress. And Desi? Thank you very much. Mr Deputy Speaker, the WASPI women in Slough and across our country have been campaigning courageously, consistently, for years now for their rights. And it is, of course, the government's duty to set out exactly how they will help them and deliver justice. Now, Secretary of State, given that someone's entitlement to receive the state pension depends upon how many years they have been paying national insurance contributions what will happen under the chancellor's plans to abolish NICs uh, for those who are yet to retire will they still receive their state pension to which they have been contributing or will their entitlements change well, Mr so, Deputy Speaker, as I'm sure the Honourable Gentleman, because I know he's um, you know, a very assiduous and uh, sensible person, I, you know, he will know that there is party politics at play over this issue, that the Chancellor, the Chancellor has been extremely clear that it is an aspiration through time, several years, maybe even beyond the next Parliament, to bring down further the level of national uh, insurance. And the reason why he says that is quite right, because we are a party that fundamentally believes in low tax. Baker. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I've probably got one of the most uh, impacted constituencies of the country, North Norfolk, with my demographics, and I know that over 5,000 WASPy women have been impacted by this. Um, I think we need to be sensible. We all recognise the financial climate that we are dealing with in this country. But I also know that the Secretary of State is a very decent man. And certainly even this weekend, the Prime Minister was intimating that we have always tried to right the injustices that this country has seen. So for those WASPy women that are watching this this afternoon, can he at least, from the dispatch box, throw them a lifeline and some sort of commitment yeah. that we will at least do everything we possibly can to try to support as many WASPy women that have been impacted by this as this country will be able to do? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, the important point here is that we carefully consider this report and not any one aspect of it, but all aspects of it in its uh, entirety. And I have undertaken to the House to do that without undue delay. Lloyd Lloyd. Thank you very much. The, the Ombudsperson was established to deliberate when things weren't necessarily illegal, but when things had been done that were malpractice and wrong, and needed a person in the middle to come forward and say, you need to sort this out. That is exactly what the Ombudsperson has now said. So rather than hiding behind court judgments, it might have been illegal or not, not in the case, the judgment is clear from the Ombudsperson that malpractice, maladministration happened. Will the Minister now apologise on behalf of the Department for that and commit to at least a remedy? I'm not saying what the remedy has to be, but give reassurance that a remedy will be found and he will apologise. Two easy things that he should be able to do now. Well, the Honourable Sorry. Gentleman suggests that we're hiding behind the court cases, and I've explained the relevance of those and the conclusions to which both the High Court and the Court of Appeal uh, came in 2019 and 2020. I'm not, we're not hiding behind anything. And in fact, in terms of our interactions as a department uh, with the Ombudsman, as the Honourable Gentleman knows, because I've read the quote out earlier, uh, the Chief Executive on Sky News on Thursday, the 21st of March, last Thursday, said the government and the DWP completely cooperated with our report, with our investigation, and over the period of time we have been working, they have provided us with the evidence we have asked for. Alison Thewlis. Waspy women in my constituency have campaigned relentlessly for many, many yeah. years now, and I pay tribute to all of them, but particularly to Rosie Dixon, who has done yeah, so yeah. much yeah. around various yeah. different events and, uh, around Glasgow uh, and coming down here to put her case directly in Parliament. When Waspy women are watching this at home, when the Minister says that they're going to carefully consider things, they hear more delay. Yeah. They hear they're not going to get the money they're entitled to. And they hear there are going to be too many more women who die before they see a penny from this government. Mm -hmm. When will they receive their money? I really think, Mr Deputy Stand. Speaker, that suggest that coming to this dispatch box without a fully formed 
set of proposals in the form that the Right Honourable Lady may wish. Given that the report, the report was published as, as early ago as just this Thursday, is a bit of a stretch. And I think what her constituents and others will want is a government that looks very carefully, gives great consideration to the complex issues around this matter, to the findings contained within the report, and also engages closely with Parliament, exactly as we did with the Ombudsman. Richard Bergen. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Government had to be dragged kicking and screaming to even acknowledge the injustice done to thousands of innocent postmasters. This, too, is an incredible injustice. Millions of women born in the 1950s have been betrayed. 3.5 million women affected. One dying every 13 minutes, and we've been in this chamber for an hour. 28,000 people have signed a letter from the WASPI campaign to the Leader of the House asking for an urgent debate and series of votes on compensation options, including that proposed by the APPG on this issue. This injustice can't carry on any longer. And I know that the Secretary of State has sought to avoid answering the question, when is this going to happen? In due course isn't good enough. Without due delay isn't good enough. When is it going to happen? When are we going to get to debate on it? And when are we going to get to votes on proper compensation packages? Uh, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman has been here long enough to ask questions of me at the dispatch box about when debates may or may not occur, etc., which are matters which are typically uh, uh, handled between the usual channels, not least between his party and mine. It is quite, um, quite extraordinary that he should be trying to get me to sort of set out a timetable of debates. Many of these things will be a matter, many of these things will be a matter for Parliament uh, rather rather than government. But he's right to raise Horizon, where I'm very proud of the fact that this government has acted at speed, has brought forward legislation to make sure that those people uh, get uh, the, um, uh, the monies and the reparations that they deserve. Tim Farron. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, taking the Secretary of State back to his initial remarks as we began this statement, he said something which I think is clearly wrong. He said that women clearly had not lost out. Well, they have. Thousands in my constituency have lost out financially through no fault of their own. They planned for their retirement on the basis of out-of-date information. They then got effectively penalised for taking on caring responsibilities, including allowing their children to work and to pay taxes by providing the best kind of childcare for their grandchildren, all of which was disrupted by a failure, a collective failure of the state. And many, as has been said, have died before justice was delivered. Now, for years, those of us who sought to get justice for the Wasp Wasp women have been met with the same response, we must wait for the Ombudsman's report. Well, Deputy, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we now have the yeah. Ombudsman's report, so will the Secretary of State now comply, apologise to the women and pay compensation to them as recommended in the report? Yeah. Well, the, the reference actually that the Honourable Gentleman refers to was no direct loss, and that was a conclusion drawn by the Ombudsman in his report. Uh, as to how quickly uh, we are able to uh, proceed, I just simply remind him again that this report was published on Thursday. Today is Monday afternoon. These are complex matters. It is quite right and proper that they are considered in detail, very carefully indeed, but also that there is engagement with Parliament in an appropriate way, exactly as there was with the Ombudsman. To hear Ali. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In my own constituency of Birmingham Hall Green, I have 4,760 WASPI women who have been campaigning tirelessly uh, for pension justice. Given that the report has now been published, will the Secretary of State commit to a timeline that will make sure that they are adequately and swiftly uh, compensated for the harms that they have suffered? Mr Deputy Speaker, as the Honourable Gentleman will know, that is a question that in various forms has been asked now probably a dozen or more uh, times, and the answer is going to always be, at least is always going to be consistent, and that is that there is no desire to delay matters and uh, there will be no undue delays in terms of our deliberation. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. There can't be a member of this House that hasn't met 
women affected by this, that hasn't met the WASPy campaign, that hasn't been moved by the pain and the awful stories that they've been through as a result of this yeah. maladministration by successive governments. Anyone watching this today in this lengthy convoluted statement from the Minister will be left confused yeah. as to actually what is going to happen now. Could he tell us, in words of one syllable, when those women who are victims of this maladministration will be able to receive the compensation they justly deserve. Yeah. Well, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, with great respect to the right honourable gentleman, that is just another version of the same question about timing, and I have given a very clear answer on that matter. Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I've heard many ministers stand at that dispatch box and say they're working at pace or there's no undue delay in dealing with scandals. This is a real opportunity, I think, for Parliament. The Ombudsman laid this report in front of Parliament for a very good reason, because he didn't think the DWP would accept the recommendations around maladministration. So it would be correct, wouldn't it, that if a backbencher wished to put down an amendment to a government bill implementing the recommendations of the Ombudsman, the government would support that, wouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, that Mr Deputy Speaker, you're invited to comment, uh, indeed, let alone support an unknown amendment to an unknown bill, is a little bit of a stretch. Joanna Che. Thank you, Mr yeah. Deputy Speaker. Um, the WASPy campaign have, have asked me to emphasise their annoyance at how often government ministers, when talking about these issues, attempt to muddy the waters by referring back to the unsuccessful litigation to reverse the increase to the state pension age yeah. or to claim direct discrimination. Of course, that was not litigation by the official WASPy campaign. Yeah. And I'm sure they would be very annoyed to hear a, la a senior Labour frontbencher doing the same thing on the radio last night. So can I ask the Minister to take the chance from the dispatch box to assure the WASPy campaign that going forward government ministers won't attempt to muddy the waters by referring back to what is now irrelevant litigation and instead the government will focus on how to implement the Ombudsman's recommendations. Yeah. Well I, I, I don't think I can accept uh, Mr Deputy Speaker that litigation, particularly when it's in the, the High Court, and I know the Right Honourable Lady will know about legal matters and the Court of Appeal, it is just not relevant, particularly as it did pertain to the matters that are under debate at the moment. Just the matters. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As the Secretary of State quite rightly pointed out, this report has been five years in the offing, so his department have known for an awful long time that it's coming. And they must have also known it was a possibility that compensation would have been recommended. So I'm sure the Secretary of State running his department in a prudent fashion has set aside some contingency funding for that very eventuality. Can he tell us how much that is? Secretary of State. Well, once again, Mr Deputy Speaker, the, the Honourable Gentleman is uh, trying to draw me in to forming conclusions prematurely about a report that is uh, complex, uh, needs uh, quite a a uh, high level of uh, study and consideration to be given to it, and that is what we will now do. Kirsten Oswald. Mr Deputy Speaker, these 1950s women have been shockingly let down by Westminster. Mm -hmm. They fought this for years and years, but now instead of properly acknowledging the, failure, the failings that the Ombudsman has highlighted, and as the Ombudsman Chief Executive said, doing the right thing, it, it feels like the Minister has come here today with precisely nothing to say. It feels mm. like he's trying to gaslight these Waspy women. Yep. Mm. It's a disgrace and shame on the and Labour the Party bench. going along Absolutely. with this charade. This is a terrible, protracted injustice yeah. which has devastated the lives of so many women. It's time to give these women the justice that they deserve, give them their compensation now, before many more of them die waiting. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I can reassure the Honourable Lady that, of course, we have taken this entire situation extremely seriously. You have heard the remarks of the Chief Executive Officer uh, of the Ombudsman relating to uh, the quality of the engagement that the Ombudsman received from my department. I have also set out, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, that we provided uh, over a thousand pages of evidence uh, to the investigation. I have also reassured the House will uh, delay uh, our response and that we will engage appropriately with Parliament exactly as we have done with the Ombudsman. 
Damia Griffiths. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I must first uh, declare an interest as a 1950s women, woman. Uh, now, the, the Secretary of State knows absolutely that real hardship was caused for some women in this age group in 2011, when the former Chancellor George Osborne, backed by Conservative and Lib Dem members, fast forwarded the changes. But as the Ombudsman said, previous administration in the communication of state pension age did result in complainants losing ops to opportunities to prepare. But women affected will be very disappointed by the Secretary of State's statement, especially as the first stage of the Ombudsman report in 2021 highlighted DWP failings. So can you please be more precise than saying no undue delay and tell us in which months we can expect a proper government response? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, that is once again a question about what the timing is. I have given a very clear response to that. I have given an assurance to the House there will be no undue delay uh, as we approach those matters, and uh, that, that is the answer to her question. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I say to the Secretary of State, we need to recognise that the Ombudsman has said that there has been maladministration. Let's remember that. And I would say to the Secretary of State, he needs to read the room. There's a consensus right across this chamber that compensation should be paid. And let's remember that this is about women who paid national insurance, anticipating of receiving a pension, and they were hit with a bombshell that their pension was being deferred, in some cases by up to six years, but with only 15 months' written notice. Can you imagine what would happen in this place? if it was announced that private sector pensions were being put back by six years. Rightly, there would be outrage, and it's right that there should be outrage as to what happened to the WASPy women. This was an entitlement taken away from them. Women that had a reasonable expectation of retiring denied to them. The government should have recognised the failings and should have compensated the 3.8 million years ago. Now we have the determination of marriage administration. Let's make sure this is not another horizon or a contaminated blood story. Let's make sure that the government comes back at pace after the Easter recess with firm proposals that the House can discuss. People can focus well, on their questions, right. please. That would be really useful. Secretary of State. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, um, I, I'm fully aware, as the Right Honourable Gentleman will know, what the findings of the report are. They do, of course, as he will know, raise many, many questions, and we need to look very carefully at those questions. We will not delay in so doing, but that is the reason why uh, I have come to the House today to assure the House that we will do exactly that and that we will engage with Parliament in an appropriate way. Mike Amesbury. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Today's statement, interim statement, felt like a non-statement. Mm. Spoke about clarity, but offered no clarity at all to mm. WASPy women and certainly members of this House. Again, I, I will repeat what lots of people repeat across the Chamber. You know, actually, on <laughs> what day, in what month, can we expect a full statement? And very importantly, WASPy women up and down the country expect that full statement. Yeah. Well, the Honourable Gentleman has raised the same question that I have now probably answered and responded to probably two dozen times uh, by now, and the, re the answer remains the same, that we will look at these matters extremely carefully, which is what everybody who has an interest in these matters would expect us to do, to do it diligently and carefully. The report was only published uh, as recently as Thursday. It is now Monday. Uh, we will be uh, looking at these issues very carefully indeed. There will be no undue delay. We will uh, make sure that we interact with Parliament in an appropriate fashion, as we did with the Gavin Newlands. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. It talks about time, but it's nearly a decade since the Wasby campaign started, including rallies and protests, court cases, thousands of meetings to lobby MPs and 273,000 women dying. Uh, and those who remain can perhaps see some light at the end of the tunnel. I say some light because the Ombudsman should have gone further in both the impact DWP malpractice had and the compensation it's recommending. But it looks like the, that, that light um, is actually a train with the Chancellor and Shadow Chancellor in control. After all that they've gone through, including my constituent, one of the test cases in the report, uh, who at times has treated this like a, a full-time job, is he really going to ask them to wait just a little, little bit longer and then break convention and ignore the findings of the Ombudsman? 
Here, 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 here. Well, given that we haven't uh, responded to the findings of the Ombudsman for the reasons yet, for the reasons that I've given, that this needs to be done in a diligent and careful manner, um, I'm not sure that his, his question entirely, his assertion, holds water. That this report, Mr Deputy Speaker, was five years in the making. It is covering highly complex matters. There are many, many questions that are raised as a consequence. We will look at those questions and those findings extremely carefully and come forward uh, to the House uh, without undue delay, whilst engaging with the House in an appropriate way, which is what we did with the Ombudsman. Rebecca Long Bailey. Thank you. The report's central finding of fact is that women born in the 1950s could not make informed decisions about their finances and that their sense of personal autonomy and financial control was diminished, with tens of thousands plunged into poverty. So the issue now is not whether these women faced injustice. The report makes clear that they did, that these women are entitled to urgent compensation from the government and that Parliament must identify a mechanism for providing appropriate redress. So can the Secretary allay my concerns that he's not proposing to question the findings of the Ombudsman, but rather when he returns after the Easter recess, he will be setting out appropriate mechanisms for redress that we can debate in this House? Well, what we're doing, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, is considering the uh, findings, and those findings need to be considered in their entirety in order to come to a view. Chris Stevens. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I want to pay tribute to the Waspy campaigners in Glasgow who I met on International Women's Day at the Mary Barber statue, including yeah. the great Cathy MacDonald, a fantastic yeah. Glasgow South West constituent. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, surely the, the Secretary of State accepts that it is unacceptable in 2024 that women continue to experience inequality in lifetime savings. Women would need to work an additional 19 years to have the same pension savings as men. So inequalities in lifetime savings, a gender pension gap and maladministration of state pension uh, age changes. This is a triple whammy to 1950s born women. So when will they get justice and equal treatment? Here, here. The Honourable Gentleman um, concludes by asking the same question that has been asked now many times. Uh, there will be no undue delay. Uh, we, will, we will look at the issues, uh, including some of the points that he has raised uh, in the round, uh, looking at uh, the entirety of the report uh, and all the points and conclusions that it comes to. He will know that there are many steps that we have taken to help to increase uh, the level of uh, women uh, involved uh, receiving pensions, including the auto enrolment uh, reforms that we have brought forward, which in the private uh, pension space have had a very dramatic, uh, shown a very dramatic improvement in the level of pension provision for women up and down the country. John Macdonald. The, <clears throat> the report is absolutely clear that the failure of the DWP, and it's a systemic failure, is that. It did not even draw upon and learn from its own research mm. about the failure of communication to these women. And in addition to that, it did not investigate properly and respond to the complaints. That's straightforward in the report. So can I say to the Secretary of State, maybe as a warning, the anger out there will be not that he hasn't come up with a scheme immediately, but he hasn't even acknowledged the failings of his own department. And that's why this report recommends it's Parliament it deals with this matter, because I believe members of this House now share the same feelings of the Ombudsman and the WASPy women, that we have no confidence in the Department of Work and Pensions in being able to resolve this basic failure that it undertook <laughs> decades ago. Well, the right honourable gentleman, um, I think, refers to one part of the findings within uh, the report, uh, where there, the ombudsman did find maladministration, however, did not find, I believe, injustice. If I understood the point to which he was specifically referring, but the point that I make to him and to others in the house is that we do need, we do need to look at this properly. We cannot simply take a report of a hundred pages to which my department provided a thousand pages of evidence 
to receive that report on a Thursday and do anything other than for me to responsibly come to the House now and make it very clear that we will act without undue delay and that we will uh, interact with Parliament in an appropriate manner, exactly as we did with the Ombudsman. Alan Durans. Speaker, and good afternoon. Mr Deputy Speaker, incredibly sadly, my constituents, Margaret Meikle and Morag Sain, are just two of a significant number of women in my constituency and elsewhere who have died whilst enduring years of prevarication and inaction by successive governments in relation to the maladministration of their pensions. It is estimated that nationally around 40,000 people, women, have died each year who may have been eligible for compensation and that nationally 270,000 women have already died without ever receiving an apology, justice or compensation. Will the Secretary of State commit to ensuring that due consideration will be made to compensating not only eligible women still living but also to the relatives of those who have died whilst awaiting justice in this matter when this comes back to the House. Here, here. Yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I say to the Honourable Gentleman, I listen to him extremely carefully, that I think we owe it to all those to whom he has referred and to those who may be in a similar situation that we take this matter extremely seriously, that we look at it very carefully and that we come to appropriate conclusions, whilst making sure that we uh, interact with uh, Parliament uh, in an appropriate way, very much as we did in our interactions with the Ombudsman himself. Imran Hussain. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm not sure why the Minister has come to this House today to tell this House and Waspy women nothing apart from he's considering uh, the uh, report. And he keeps talking about the complexities of the report. Well, one simple finding at the heart of this report is that it is for this government and this parliament to remedy the grave injustices against the thousands of waspy women in my constituency and the many thousands up and down this country. Honourable members from across this House have asked the Minister quite reasonably for a time scale and he just refuses to commit and uses the words undue delay. Will the Minister at least accept every time a Minister stands up and uses undue delay or in due process, what they really mean is that we have no intention to address this. We are saving face and kicking the can down the road. Uh, no, Mr Deputy Speaker, I do not accept that. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister uh, very much for his statement? The Ombudsman's report has made recommendations based upon maladministration uh, and the fact that the 1950s women were misled and not notified of, the, of their rights, and that's a very, very serious issue. Many people have contacted me. One of my constituents said that some nearly 300,000 women have paid uh, a pass away already and, uh, and continue to pass away each day without seeing a single penny, and not forgetting those who are suffering physical and mental disabilities after a lifetime of work and child rearing. Many grandmothers have gone on to care for elderly parents and providing unpaid support so that their daughters and their sons can return to work in support of the UK economy. Time is not on the side, Mr Deputy Speaker, of the WASPy woman. Restitution, apologies, compensation. Does the Secretary of State not agree, as my constituent suggestion has made, that Government agree to urgently pay a reasonable lump sum, followed by an increase in their pension payments until the deficit is recouped, thereby making this easier to balance? With the public purse. Well, I certainly do accept, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that we need to proceed in a manner that does not delay uh, matters for the reasons that he has given. And I think we do owe it to the people to whom he has referred that we do proceed without undue delay, and that we do that by very carefully considering the report in its entirety, looking very closely at its findings. I am satisfied, as indeed the Chief Executive Officer of the Ombudsman is satisfied, that the engagement between my department and the Ombudsman uh, was full and complete, um, and we will continue to proceed uh, in that uh, basis, working closely with Parliament and, of course, uh, also in the same spirit that we worked closely with the Ombudsman. Morris. Mr Deputy Speaker, to say the Secretary of State will disappoint the 5,000 WASPy women 
in my constituency and the many tens of thousands across the North East is an understatement. Frankly, I think the Minister's response is shameful. Shameful. And I want to take issue with what he said about the complexity of the report. He said it's only been five days. A hundred-page report. Well, I'm not a speed reader, but I reckon that's 20 pages a day. And the issues that are raised aren't out uh, bolts out of the blue. The WASPy women have been active campaigning for over 10 years, highlighting issues and the potential remedies. I don't think this will wash in the, in the country, Mr Deputy Speaker, with the response we've had. The Minister says there are 200,000 less pensioners in poverty. 270,000 WASPy women have died waiting for justice. I want to know how many more are going to die before he finally comes along and implements those recommendations in full. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, the, the answer on timing is the same answer that I've given consistently throughout this statement, despite having been asked it. I have been asked it probably now three dozen times, and the answers remain the same. Yeah, this, is a complex, this is a complex report, and indeed, the, the honourable, if the Honourable Member would allow me, the, the Honourable uh, Member should be aware that, as far as I am aware, that is not a matter of dispute, even between us on this side of the House and the Opposition. We both accept it is a complex report. We both accept we need to look very carefully at the findings in order to come to conclusions, and that is exactly what we will do. Brendan O'Hara. Speaker, despite how the Minister might wish to spin this, the Ombudsman's report was absolutely damning totally vindicating the Waspy, Waspy women and their campaign. Too many people thought, indeed, fervently hoped that they'd give up and go away, but they picked a wrong fight with the wrong woman. And I'd like to congratulate Anne Greer and the Waspy women of Argyll and the Isles for niving, giving up this fight. Yeah. My honourable friend from Kilmarnock and Loudoun has a private member's bill, but would require the Secretary of State to publish proposals for a compensation scheme for Waspy women. The vehicle is their minister. Will the government now work with my honourable friend from Kilmarnock and Loudoun and support his private member's bill so that we can bring this to a conclusion as swiftly as possible? Yeah. Well, uh, private member's bills, and I'm not uh, familiar with the, all the details of the private member's bill uh, to which the honourable gentleman has referred, um, will clearly be whether a, a government uh, uh, decides to support a particular bill uh, will be a matter for the usual channels. It will be a matter for the government business managers and a matter for the government, not for me at this dispatch box at this time. Rupa Hart. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The WASPI website has a grim counter of, effect, of affected women's deaths and of money saved by the Treasury. The figures at the moment are 273,000 plus and well over 4 billion, and they're rising by the minute. How far has their 2022 disastrous mini budgets consequences affected their thinking on all this? And if he won't commit to full level six compensation as the Ombudsman recommends, what has he got to offer Linda Gregory, my constituent, born in 1953, who did the right thing, as he said. She did her sums, got her forecasts, was repeatedly assured by the DWP and HMRC that she had contributions to retire at 60 to look after her ailing mum before this surprise was sprung on her and has cost her so far 40 grand. I think, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, with great respect to the Honourable Lady, her question perfectly exemplifies why it is important to look at the detail of the report, because she refers to the uh, Ombudsman having recommended the full uh, level six level of compensation. It's actually level four, which is a range of between £1,000 and £2,950. So I'm afraid that piece of information was simply inaccurate. Kenny McCaskill. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Sadly, we have had a reprise of known facts, not the resolution of a manifest wrong. Governments frequently have to address the faults or failings of their predecessors of whatever political cue. That is called the responsibility of being in office, and it is part of the privilege of holding government. Equally, we also have to remember that when there is an institutional fail failure that goes across political parties and, indeed, government institutions, we have independent bodies to address them, such as an ombudsman. In these circumstances, will the Minister first of all accept that there has been a manifest wrong and injustice? And secondly, commit that he will not, under any circumstances, seek to undermine 
the decision of the Ombudsman or the direction of travel that the, she has embarked upon? Well, the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right that there is a very specific purpose of, for an Ombudsman, as there indeed is a purpose for this Ombudsman. But what I think is unreasonable is to take the step in logic from that to saying that one should just simply, within a matter of hours, stand up and accept everything that the Ombudsman has put forward. What we have quite rightly said, and I'm saying at the dispatch box today, is that we will consider these matters, the findings, uh, the circumstances and so on, in very great detail in order to come to the appropriate decision. Chris Law. Give us a deputy speaker. Um, what's we women in my constituency at Dundee simply cannot wait? In fact, as you've heard across this House, there's not a single constituency where what's we women can wait. And there's a simple reason for that. 40,000 of them are dying every year. Over a quarter of a million have died over this 10-year campaign. And not once have they had an apology, received any justice, and certainly no compensation. The PHSO report was published. Both the UK Government and the Labour Party have deliberately failed to answer and fully guarantee that full justice and fair compensation will be delivered to the WASPI women. So a simple question is, and you failed to answer so far, can you give us a time frame by which you are going to deliver an apology justice and compensation, and can it be before the next general election? Well, Mr Speaker, the, 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 the Honourable Gentleman has been in this, this chamber, I think, since the beginning of this statement. I'm sure he has, and he heard the statement, hence he's asking a question. And he will know that the question he has asked has been asked now probably a couple of dozen times. And the, the, answer, the answer is the same. Well, you, he chunters from a sedentary position, but the answer is just the same, which is the responsible thing to do is to look at this highly complex matter. A report that uh, was published on Thursday, it is now... Uh, Monday early evening. It is not unreasonable to expect the Government uh, and indeed Parliament, because of uh, the way the, the, the report has been laid before Parliament, to look at the detail of that report. We gave, as a department, around a thousand pages of evidence that informed that particular report. There are some very important findings within it, and I think in order to do it justice, we need to look at it carefully. What in days? Mr Deputy Speaker, 6,900 WASPy women in my constituency, some of whom have lost out by as much as £60,000, many of them in dire need of compensation, will have found little encouragement in the Minister's statement. Can he tell me, is it this Government's policy to dither, to delay and to deny justice until the 1950s born women have died off? Hear, hear. I, I can give a very short answer to that. Absolutely not. Yeah, but not, not far. Ronnie, Ronnie Campbell. Sorry. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Wasby campaign has been conducted with great dignity. They have lobbied and informed all of us in here. Can I ask that the outgoing government and the incoming government show these women some respect that they are due and commit to paying compensation? I'm not even asking for a, a timetable here. Just commit to paying compensation. And before the Minister says... I only got the report <coughs> last Thursday. Had he listened to the PHSO evidence given to the PAC Act Select Committee, the writing was clearly on the wall that compensation was going to be in this report. What I'm not really clear about, Madam Deputy Speaker, is why the Honourable Gentleman is urging me and the Government to draw a premature conclusion on the basis of... No, on the basis... It would be premature, because, as he points out, the report arrived on Thursday. It is now... Monday, very early evening. It is complicated. It is absolutely right and proper that we look at it very carefully and in great detail. And it is only right and proper we do that for those people that are concerned with this matter. And that is precisely what we will do. We will act without undue delay. We will make sure that we engage with this House in an appropriate fashion, as we did with the Ombudsman himself. Stuart C. Macdonald. Uh, yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, the expression justice delayed is justice denied has never seemed more appropriate with so many thousands of WASPI women waiting for justice to be delivered and dying in the process. Uh, 
Madam Speaker, it's not just the five years waiting for the Ombudsman report, but it's years before that jumping through DWP complaints process hoops and independent case examiner hoops as well. So as well as delivering swift compensation, will his government look at fixing the system that has delayed for the best part of a decade delivery of justice for WASPy women? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. We will look closely at the report and we will draw no doubt many conclusions as a result of that process of careful examination of the findings and the points made within that report. My commitment to the House is we will do that without undue delay and that we will also engage appropriately with Parliament as part of that approach. I thank the uh, Secretary of State uh, for his statement and we now come to the business of the day and the clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Investigatory Powers Amendment Bill Lords, as amended in the Public Bill Committee, to be considered. Now. Thank you. We will begin with New Clause 1, with which it will be convenient to, con to consider the other new clauses and amendments as listed on the selection paper. I call Shadow Minister Dan Jarvis to move New Clause 1. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a privilege to open the report stage debate of this important bill. And at the outset, it's worth reiterating that we support the bill, which updates aspects of the Investigative Powers Act 2016. That's because it's imperative that legal frameworks are updated to ensure that our police and security services keep up with changes to communications technology. Doing so ensures that they are always one step ahead of criminals and malign forces who seek to harm us and undermine our national security. Now, I hope the Minister uh, and all those members who were present at the Bill Committee will agree with me that we had a constructive debate testing the Bill's proportionality and robustness. Some matters relating to third-party bulk personal data sets and the oversight process relating to the addition of new BPDs to existing category authorisations have been largely resolved to the satisfaction of these benches. However, there are some other important matters that still require addressing. Therefore, I will speak to the amendments that stand in my name before speaking on some of the amendments tabled by other members. New Clause 1 in my name seeks to ensure that the Secretary of State publishes an annual report on the engagement between the Prime Minister and the Intelligence and Security Committee, the ISC, regarding the investigatory powers regime. A very similar amendment was tabled at the committee stage, but was withdrawn after a lengthy debate on the ISC oversight arrangements did not make any meaningful progress, despite very helpful contributions from the Right Honourable Members for North Durham and the Right Honourable Member for South Holland and the Deepings. Therefore, we've tabled this amendment again because I think that the Government must recognise that the ISC has a vital role to play in the democratic oversight of some of the most powerful measures the State has at its disposal to keep us safe, to intercept communications and to interfere with equipment. The ISC is and should be the only Committee of Parliament that can appropriately hold a Prime Minister to account on investigatory powers. There must be accountability at the highest level, and the Prime Minister is no exception. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, many members, not least members of the ISC, know that this important mechanism isn't just broken, it's stopped working altogether. Not since 2014 has a Prime Minister appeared before the Committee, and when asked about successive Prime Ministers' lack of appearance at the Committee, the Minister said that such decisions were above his pay grade. And that might, well, that might well be true, at least for now. So, if the Minister cannot commit to reinstating the Convention of Prime Ministers appearing before the Committee, this amendment, at the very minimum, would ensure that this new Convention of non-attendance is reviewed annually, scrutinised by this House and the other place. Therefore, I give notice of our intention to push this amendment to a vote this evening. Moving on to, happy to give way to our right honourable friend. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. On, on that point, it's not above a minister's pay grade to be able to confirm. Does he agree with me 
um, that the conventions and the particular arrangements that give the ISC a, a, a particular constitutional place in the way that our system works ought to operate, even if they haven't operated for the last 10 years. And uh, uh, does he, like me, look forward to being able to hear the minister not just dismiss this really important concern and dereliction of a constitutional duty which has happened, but um, to give us an assurance that this will not be the case going forward. I'm, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful to my right hon. Friend. I think she makes an important point, and I think the point that she makes, I suspect, is one that the overwhelming majority of members of this House would agree with. I'm wondering if the right honourable gentleman wants to give way. Happy to. Uh, the Honourable General for, for giving way. I was the minister that took the bill through the House that created the ISC. Uh, and at the time, the intention was that it would evolve to become a very powerful committee. But it didn't absent the entire House from some responsibility. And two elements come to that. One is what he's just mentioned, the Prime Minister appearing before them. And the second is the minimal redaction of the reports that the committee creates. And one of the problems we've had in recent years is excessive redaction of those reports. Does he have any views on that? I'm grateful to the right honourable gentleman. I think he makes two important points. I, I, I agree with both of the points that he, he's made. I think he makes an important point about redaction. I also think he makes an important point about the attendance of the Prime Minister. I don't think it is unreasonable to expect that once a year the Prime Minister seeks to meet with what is a very important cross-party committee of this House. I'm very grateful to give way to the Minister should he wish to add his own views to this matter, but my sense of where the House is and from the debates that we've had previously, most right honourable and honourable members will agree that it is not an unreasonable ask for the Prime Minister to turn up once a year. Happy to give way. Extremely grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. Uh, his point is made more potent by the fact that the matters that the ISC considers are not typically, in fact, not at all partisan. The way the committee operates is on a non partisan basis, although, of course, it has members drawn from across the House. And the material it studies is not seen through a party political prism in any way. Now, this minister is engaged in uh, sensible and meaningful discussion with members of the ISC, I know, in the course of the passage of this legislation, in exactly that spirit. So the meeting of the Prime Minister would be conducted in a way which I think no Prime Minister could reasonably object to. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, the, the Right Honourable Gentleman speaks with a lot of authority on these matters, not just as a member of the committee, but as a former security minister. I think he's described the situation uh, very well, and I hope uh, the Prime Minister is listening, uh, and I hope the Prime Minister um, accepts what I think essentially has been a very reasonable and constructive invitation that has just been extended to him by the Right Honourable Member. And I hope that the Prime Minister does take the opportunity in the near future to sit down with the ISC and to discuss what are, after all, very important matters. Madam Deputy Speaker, moving on to new clause 2 standing in my name. This would ensure that an annual report is published on the measures included in this bill and the IPA 2016 in defeating and disrupting technology-enabled serious organised crime and technology-enabled threats to our national security. We have tabled this amendment because we must ensure that law is always one step ahead of those who seek to harm us. The police and the security services are not best able to protect us today with the laws to counter the threats of yesterday. And that's why we support this bill to update the IPA 2016, now eight years old, but there is an opportunity to go further. An annual report proposed in our amendment will help identify any changes required to primary legislation relating to investigatory powers are identified and implemented as quickly as possible. This would strengthen our legislative framework on national security and weaken the capability and the resolve of criminals and our adversaries. It's also uh, genuinely, I think, an opportunity for government 
to work better with and constructively challenge telecommunications operators and the wider communications technology, technology industry on the requirements to use investigatory powers, which would be a separate process from the new notices regime included in part four of this bill. A statutory requirement to produce an annual report on investigatory powers to counter threats to our safety and security would strengthen national security, as well as strengthening the oversights and safeguards of measures to help keep us safe. Two principles that guide this bill and the IPA 2016. That's why we will, and I give notice, Madam Deputy Speaker, seek to push this amendment to a vote later this evening. Happy to give way to my honourable friend. In fact, for what he's saying, I do hope at the end of the night we can, we can have some um, uh, conclusion of, of agreement. But in relation to the tech companies, I understand the information that I have. Apple, uh, Tech UK, Information Technology Industry Council and the Computer and Communications Industry Association have all expressed concerns. Is the Shadow Minister aware of their concerns and what it means for them as companies, how they can, they, they can administrate and do their work? Uh, and, and does the Honourable Gentleman Right on, gentlemen, agree that what we have tonight is a consensus that uh, uh, protects them, but also protects uh, the ordinary person in society. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm very grateful to the honourable member, who I know takes these matters incredibly seriously. I think he raises an important point. I think, to be absolutely fair to the minister and to his department, I know that this is a matter uh, that the government um, have considered very, very carefully. I know that there's been quite an extensive process of consultation with a range of different tech companies, 